This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon and welcome to the Sunset Safari where we'll hopefully find all sorts of wonderful animals. Now, my name is Taylor and on camera with me today is Sebastian and we are driving around in the Sabi sand trying to find elephants to start the afternoon off. So, if you'd like to chat to us, it's fairly easy. You can either talk to us on the YouTube chat or you can also talk to us via Twitter by using the hashtag Safari Live at the end of your questions. Now, if you are wondering why your questions are not being answered, you must ask relevant questions and I always like to give examples. So if we are looking at the blue blue sky and you ask about an earthworm, no questions probably not going to get asked. So try keep it relevant to what we're seeing. Remember we do stick kind of stick around with the animals for some time so you should have a chance, well you should be able to get your questions in, in case you don't think of them straight away. Uh, <clears throat> right, I think we're gonna go try find the herd of elephants that we were with this morning. You may have seen if you watch the sunrise safari we had a beautiful herd of elephants. We had a very cheeky young elephant bull that was investigating around the car. I'd quite like to go and say, hello, have you learned any manners yet? Uh, to him, to see if he's, if he's going to behave himself. He wasn't actually ugly at all. He was just very sweet and very curious. It was quite, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the experience. But that is for sure. Wonderful. So, if you're gonna go that way. Ah. Tristan, of course, has beaten me to it because he's just so good at safariing. Let's go say hello to him. He also has an elephant. Uh, I can see Taylor is going to be in one of those moods today where he's, she's going to give me trouble at every turn, which, which should make for an entertaining afternoon, that's for sure. And yes, we have beaten you to the Ellie's this afternoon. It's not that it was very difficult. We had a heads up before we even got going. As Taylor mentioned, my name is Tristan on camera. I've got David this afternoon, and it is a very warm welcome to all of you. Hope that you are going to enjoy the next few hours as you ride along with us, and hopefully it will be a good one. If the Ellie is anything to go by, it should be a productive afternoon, at least the sun is out from the gloomy start to the day and that might drive a couple of the animals to start moving and getting to some water just like this Ellie bull probably already has done. He's now having a good feed on the jackalberry that is overhanging the dam wall and that's Hosanna's jackalberry so Hosanna won't be too impressed that his shade is being taken as this young bull Ellie feeds. It's probably the only real green leaves that are around at this stage and we're just going to see where it goes from here. I didn't go onto the dam wall itself because there's really nowhere for that Ellie to go. It's not a comfortable place for the Ellie to be in so I didn't want it to freak out so we stopped a little bit away, a bit of a distance but I quite like it. David and I were just commenting that it's quite nice with the kind of natural archway of the tree and the Ellie just sitting underneath it in the beautiful blue sky in the background. It really is a seriously beautiful day this afternoon it's kind of changed completely you know this morning we were in jackets it was cold it was miserable there was gray overcast weather and it's now turned into a perfect perfect spring afternoon and really the conditions are not too bad they're not excessively hot there's a bit of a cool breeze blowing so it should be good for game viewing this afternoon now sorry emma i struggled to hear you there if you can just repeat that for me Ah, so apex, Ellie bulls that are alone, um, not necessarily, um, they get a bad rap or reputation for their, you know, because they go into this heightened level of testosterone when they go into must, everybody kind of thinks that elephant bulls are these dangerous creatures that you can't go anywhere near them and when they're on their own that they're going to just kill you at any minute and that's not necessarily the case at all. In fact, herds can be just as dangerous if not more dangerous. They have a lot more to protect than what the bulls do. The bulls ultimately, you know, is them. They know that they're big. They know that they're strong. They know they can look after themselves whereas something like a an elephant cow when she's got a brand new baby and she feels threatened, she's going to try and protect it as best she can and so you know typically herds can be more dangerous than bulls some of the time and on foot most definitely I'd far rather walk into an elephant bull in must than I would a breeding herd of elephants that is irritated a breeding herd would be a lot more to worry about and so I don't find bulls that bad I, I mean they obviously can be aggressive but generally a bull the nice thing about him is that he'll often kind of show 
that he's not in the mood for you and you'll be able to kind of drift off long before he kind of gets close to you unless you miss all the warning signs. If you don't pay attention and you don't watch what's going on, well then, yes, you can get yourself into trouble. But a lone bull is no more dangerous than a bull in a herd or a bull that is kind of um, in accompaniment of other bulls, you know, so it just, just depends. This fellow would be probably one that you wouldn't have to worry too much about, but he's quite small still, so he's a young elephant, I would say in his sort of late teens, early 20s, so he hasn't really established himself as one of those really big guys yet, and so he'll still be a little nervous of taking things on, and you'll find if he actually tried to give you nonsense, if you stood your ground, he'd probably be a little bit unsure of himself and back off quite quickly. So you also got to take into account what size each elephant is and, and where they are in their life. The young adolescent bulls like this that are in their teens often are a little bit more kind of nervous and scared of actually pushing themselves on you than the bigger, older guys that really have the power and strength and the attitude to kind of follow through with the threat. So big cat love funny enough, we were actually talking about this last night. Um, tuskers that are within Juma and, and you know, are there any around and you know, do we see any? Um I haven't seen for quite a while. Uh, they are the odd ones that do come through here. Um it's not the best place in the Kruger National Park for or the Kruger system for Tuskers. If you go further north up into the Shinguetsi, um Punda Maria, um, Apani area, that's where you'll get these kind of massive, massive bull elephants with big, big tusks. Here, every now and then, we'll get one that rolls through here, but not really as frequently as we used to. Back in 2011, I was actually telling the guys that when I kind of first started in this northern part of the sands, there were two massive bulls that used to roam around here with huge tusks. The one had nice kind of some uh, quite symmetrical tusks that came down and kind of the typical sort of tusker that you can imagine these big long straight tusks that kind of just tipped forwards at the, at the, or curved forward at the tips um, and then there was another bull that had quite a long straight right tusk that went towards the ground and then a very heavily curved left tusk um, that kind of bent underneath his trunk almost but they were monstrous tusks very very thick and very close to the ground by the time they finished so they probably were only I would say maybe 10 inches off the ground from where the bull in the bull was standing so huge 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 tusks and I don't know what happened to either of them I, they have not been seen we just saw them for the one summer and then we didn't see them again in this area the two of them the one with the really big tusk that was had the straighter kind of shape he was quite a handful at the best of times I remember being chased by him twice in the space of a week and probably every other vehicle that came across him got the same treatment he used to see you from way 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 in the distance and you'd see he would just change his direction and come straight at you and from about a hundred meters he would already start running straight towards your direction so he was a bit of a tricky character to deal with and that's why we we didn't really get any great photos of him I actually don't recall anyone posting photos of that particular elephant because he was just always in such a kind of hurry to get you and, and to come at you that no one really stopped for long enough to actually get him. I'm sure one or two guests got a photo of him, but very few of the guides did because you actually ended up having to try and drive away. But this Ellie has really got himself in the best possible spot ever. He's kind of got himself a little shade there. He's feeding happily away. And I wonder if maybe that jackalberry doesn't have a few fruits that are also around that he could have been feeding on. And now he's decided, I think it's time to move off. Isn't that beautiful? Kind of walking out of the archway, like I say, with a blue sky, a bit of greenery, which is so kind of welcome in this dry, drab habitat that we've had over the past few months. It's nice to see a bit of green and blue in the kind of shot just to add a bit of color. Now, I'm pretty sure he's going to try and find a branch on this side. So he's just pretty much going around the tree on the wall because if he goes down behind the wall, he's actually not going to be able to f reach those leaves. It drops off quite quickly. And so the only way you can feed off this tree is by doing it from this area. So pretty cool to kind of see how he's using the wall to actually maximize his feeding opportunities. A clever, clever bull. You also will have noticed that he's only got one tusk, which is fairly common. It does happen quite often. Um, it's probably you find that that tusk broke off either at a very young age or he, maybe he was trying to dig up a root or a piece of bark or some tubers and the tusk kind of snapped. And normally what happens with these things is 
and they'll snap in the lip area area and if they slap snap above the lip line so within the area we can't see it often damages the roots and therefore the tusk won't grow but when it kind of breaks outside of that then you'll see that the tusk will continue to grow and eventually it'll grow out from that break and you'll it will be a bit shorter than the other one but it'll still be visible so this guy obviously broke it right up at the top and that's why you're not seeing it anymore this is lapwing marula season um, is probably this year given we're still quite dry at the moment I would say it'll be slightly delayed and um, so I would call it probably February uh, going into March is probably when we're gonna see a few of the marulas coming through generally though you should see marulas um, from beginning of Feb is, is normal but I reckon this year we're gonna be a bit later so I would say end of Feb towards March is when we're gonna see most of our marulas coming out now there's an unsavory insect that has landed on my car which I'm going to try and show you I'm going to try and put it on my phone because I don't actually want it on me come on climb on hello on you go come on the reason I don't want it to climb on me is because I'll tell you all about it right now now you'll see come on there we go now there is a beetle that is walking around there I'm gonna move my phone now that I've got it on the dashboard this is called a blister beetle or a meloid and these guys secrete a toxic substance that when it comes in contact with your skin it will basically burn your skin and, and form massive blisters so that's where it gets its name and it's that substance is called cantheridin and it comes out of the the joints of this beetle so it's called reflex bleeding it comes out of those joints and it goes onto the skin and then it causes a little bit of an issue now I'd, like I say, don't really like them being around because generally on contact they cause a bit of trouble. So we're going to try and use our mic just to blow it away. There we go. So that's gotten rid of the blister beetle. No, and the fun, the fun thing about them, which is really delightful, is that when they land on you, if you hit them, then they secrete this stuff, you get this blister, and if you pop those blisters and try and kind of get the liquid out, wherever that liquid touches your skin again, you often get a blister that forms after that. So that, that toxin stays and lingers for quite some time in the blister itself, which is not really very pleasant at all. It's a horrible thing to get hit by one of these things. So we're going to probably try and reposition ourselves so that I don't have to actually deal with them for much longer. Right. Now I'm going to try and kind of see if I can get another view of this Ellie while I do that though Let's send you back across to Steve who's in the Maasai Mara of course and well I wonder what he's gonna be up to this afternoon Good afternoon everybody sorry for the delay welcome to the Maasai Mara Mara Triangle my name is Steve I'm joined on camera by Big James uh, welcome we have been hit by an enormous electric storm we've just managed to get out it's still a little bit wet but it is quite incredible how quickly the storm can come and pass the wind came through at about 2.30 our time this is about two hours ago and well we've been hedging our bets whether we should be getting out but the lightning seems to have moved off further west so for now we are out and I think we've made it just in time but the dust is gone which is great that beautiful fresh smell in the air no doubt we're going to be finding all sorts of birds going crazy as they're being able to bath in the rain uh, wipe themselves on the grasses and on the trees to get themselves nice and wet as well after the rainfall and they're going to sing and re-establish any territories they might have birds love getting a little bit wet Nice little dumb crick. We will be very careful. If there is any more lightning, we will power down immediately because it can be quite unsafe with this big metal rod hanging behind the car and, well, it will just fry the equipment. So welcome, jump on board. Uh, James and I are just discussing what it is we're going to get up to. Having a look at the roads to see what, how much rain fell down here because there's some roads that are going to be inaccessible. And, well, I don't feel like becoming part of the Marshmallow Club today. There's going to be no off-road driving, so we're just going to bumble around. Maybe we'll go around towards the river, see what birds we can see along the way, and maybe this rainfall has encouraged some animals to cross. Uh, one thing I've always noticed when it rains, especially down in South Africa, especially on these very clayey type soils, is the animals always try to move away from the mud because it gets quite slippery and quite difficult for them to navigate. So they might be very stationary, they might move up the mountain, who knows, let's go and see. Well, it seems like Tristan is still with his big elephant bull. Let's go and check what they're up to. I am still with my Ellie. He's now wandered back towards the jackalberry tree and he's kind of in the shade there 
and still reaching up and managing just to get a few of the leaves from the low, low branches of this jackalberry. And I'm looking now to try and see if there's any fruit that he could potentially be going after, but it doesn't seem like it. It just seems as though there's the leaves that he's feeding on and I'm surprised because there's very few animals that actually feed off these jackalberry leaves and you find not even Ellie's feed off them that often. They seem to be quite tanninous in their taste but I suppose at this time of the year there really isn't that much else and so a few jackalberry leaves maybe are the tastiest thing that's around. Hello boy, you look very content. Kind of eyes just closing a little bit. Marcia, you say this is the best way to start the show? It is, isn't it? I absolutely love spending time with gentle giants. This morning, my drive was perfect for me because I managed to get not only Ellie's, but we also had Hosanna. And so hopefully it will be a repeat performance of that this afternoon. Hopefully we'll get both of them once again. But I thoroughly enjoy spending time with Ellie's, especially now in the hot part of the day when you know the cats are going to be fairly sleepy. It's always good to kind of find these guys and watch them go about their antics. And you know, bulls like this are often kind of, you know, feeding machines and that's all they'll do. But sometimes you kind of get them coming quite close and they can be quite curious. And so I quite enjoy being around big bulls. There's a pretty interesting kind of sensation when you're around these guys. They definitely make you feel smaller than you can even imagine especially when you get those really monstrous bulls with big tusks you kind of feel how intimidating it must be for everybody else because they kind of stand over you and you realize how insignificant you are in comparison to a bull like this yes boy it's okay he's just sniffing around now trying to see if he can find any food so Rosalind, it depends, um, depends on the time of the year, but generally you'll find that they're going to eat between 4 and 6% of their body weight. So 4% normally in the summer months when food is nutritious and full of um, nutrients and full of uh, the, the minerals that they're looking for. Whereas when you look in winter when it's dry and the, most of it has got very little moisture content and, and probably quite devoid of nutrients, you'll find that they'll eat a little bit more and their body percent or they'll eat probably more towards sort of six percent of their body percentage so you know it's it's whatever that is 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 different for every elephant because of their size and their weight um, but a really really monstrous bull would be eating close to sort of 300 um, or two probably about 200 um, kgs a day so 400 pounds maybe even more maybe up to even 600 pounds in one single 24-hour period which is crazy when you think about it so if you take the weight of grass and leaves and those kind of things and you weigh that and you think to yourself how much feeding that must take it really is astounding that they're able to get as much as they actually do and to be able to find that food so they're just constant eating machines they spend most of their life moving around trying to find food and yes maybe hanger is a real thing in an elephant particularly in this time of the year now you can see what they're doing at the moment grass is really not high up on the menu at the moment it's brown and brittle and dry and so not really tasty but watch what he does now he'll eat it and you'll see most of that grass is probably going to fall out of his mouth shortly it just depends where he's going to stop now are you going to stop there for us so we can see no He's decided he's going to kind of shove it into his mouth a little bit further and carry it with him. But what he's focusing on is more the tips of the, well, I mean the roots rather than the tips. In summer, it will be the opposite way around. They'll feed on the tips where there's a lot more seed and nutrients than there is here. Good. Well, we'll keep with our bull for now. While he's kind of mingling around below us, let's send you across to Steve and see how he's doing. I didn't copy what he's got, but he has something to show all of you. Ah. Uh. Thank you. From one big five to the other. I'm so... I love a buffalo that does this. They stare you down with a piece of grass sticking out their mouth. They just completely stop what they're doing to check you out. <laughs> it's like a young bull. He's uh, quite new in the herd. And missing a bit of melanin on the nose. He's going to get quite sunburnt there. I wonder. It must be quite uncomfortable having such a white nose or lack of pigment, should I say. When you're out in the African wilderness, your nose is going to get very well burnt. Oh, back there, James, there's two buffaloes playing around. They're busy jumping up and down. Can you see them to the right? Yeah, yeah, there we go. They were just jumping up and down. 
the coolness has dried everything, or has wet everything down, the dust is gone. There's some ox pickers on that one's back. A moment ago they were jumping in the air. Ooh, no, that's not the same ones. Over there to the right, James, a bit more. A little bit more right, there's some youngsters, or I don't know what they are. Running in a circle, tail up. Hello! <laughs> Look at that! <laughs> And the Warren always makes everybody very happy, as long as it doesn't stay for too long. It just quietens everything down, it takes the dust off things, provides moisture out in the open. You don't have to go the long distance to go and get any water. You just have to drink the gr drink off the grass. <laughs> I've never seen a buffalo running around like that. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's too funny. That's just too funny. I've seen cows doing that when they get released from like a from like a milking shed or they've been in a in a shed overnight for quite a period of time and they get let out into the long grass. They go running around like that full of excitement with the tail in the air, but I've never seen a buffalo do that. <laughs> He's just loving it. Loving life. Churning up the ground as it goes. If we watch close, you'll probably see some mud being kicked up from behind them. <laughs> My safari it is indeed frolicking. Frolicking and... <laughs> He's a bit excited. I think it's a he. It might be a young girl. Definitely playing with a big bull. Lots of excitement going on there. Quite enjoy the rain. There's the other buffalo there to the right. You can see he's just enjoying the grass seeds off the tips of those grasses there. I do like long grass buffalo, unlike wildebeest that like it quite short. Buffalo essentially need long grass. And clearly a little bit of fun as well. Nothing like a bit of a buffalo dance. You see how those other bulls have come in there a bit. Well, let's get involved in the excitement over here. A little bit of a buffalo dance on this beautiful Monday afternoon. Okay, I think they're calming down now. Excitement, pent-up energy released. I suppose that the lightning storm does that to, to individuals. They get quite excited. And are back to normal buffalo behavior. That was marvelous. Bernie, all I can assume is that's excitement. All I can assume it's excitement. When you see cattle running around, especially the youngsters, they run around with their tails in the air, I can only assume it's excitement. I've never seen a buffalo doing that before. Um, even when a herd is running away or moving very quickly away from whatever sighting or whatever encounter there might be, and I've never seen them jumping up and down. You saw how it was kicking its back legs. It was being very playful, very young in, at heart. There's a little moment there for us all to, to, to harness. Young at heart every now and again is, is good for the soul. Singing in the rain, I suppose. Even though the rain seems to have abated for now. It's definitely added some dynamic to the landscape. It makes everybody very excited. I wonder if the wildebeest will be a... Well, that should be... That's the actual name for wildebeest, wild cow. So if someone had seen a buffalo doing that, they probably would have also called them a wildebeest. Instead, a buffalo, which is a buffalo. The Afrikaans name, buffalo. It's the only wild cattle-like animal in Africa. There's lots of them around. Nice big breeding herd. There's a little youngster. And you can see it just following behind mum. Still quite brown, but you can see how wet it is. Got a bit more hair on its back than mum does. So normally got a little bit more of a chocolatey brown colour. Now it's gone a bit darker because of the amount of moisture that's landed on it. Mum's getting a bit of an ear wax cleaning. The ticks in the ears there must be really irritating. I can attest to that. I had a tick under my toe yesterday. They're still extremely itchy. Some lying down, some dancing, some eating. Lovely afternoon. The baby, Leah, baby buffalo are very cute. They're very, very cute. We'll follow mum. Where are you going, mum? Well, very good. That was a nice little little moment. There's another little youngster hiding there. They kind of get lost within the herd. It's important that they're able to keep up with the herd when it moves. But invariably, they will turn on predators. 
Anna Marie, I have heard of an albino buffalo. I've never physically seen one in the wild. I've seen photos, but I don't think they do very well. Uh, the pigment on the skin and the darkness in the skin is often, you know, melanin helps to protect skin against sunshine. Uh, you lack that pigment and the body really, really takes a hammering to sun. And uh, so an albino youngster, I just don't do very well. There's no pigment at all, so sunburn, and also they stand out really, really well. They're easily picked out from the herd, so I've never, se I've only seen photos of youngsters about the age of the ones we saw there. And I've never seen an adult, or even a sub-adult. I don't think they're able to get further than a certain sort of age. Kind of one of those genes that doesn't do very well out in this very harsh landscape. And the sunshine is very, very harsh from time to time. Especially the further south you go, the sun up here actually is very, very harsh, very burning. Doesn't feel as hot as South Africa, but we're much higher up, so the solar radiation is actually quite powerful. Okay, well, from our very joyous and playful eating buffalo, Tristan is still with his elephant. I am indeed, so very kind of unique view of Ellie's. We don't often get this view here at Juma because we generally see most of our Ellie's at the same sort of level, if not kind of a little bit higher than us. And so as you look down on one, you can see a few different kind of things. You can see a lot of the muscles around the head and neck area that protrude out the top, as well as the kind of back and how that spine shifts and moves when they move. It's very, very cool to kind of see. You can also see deep into their ears, which is a bit weird, because, you know, often we think their ear is behind that flap, but it's actually in front. So there you can see the ear right there. And that's where the sound will funnel into. And so when that ear is kind of pushed out, it's actually catching a lot of sound waves and going in there. You'll also notice it's very hairy around that ear, and that's to block all that dust. Then they dust bathing and throwing that in mud when they're swimming from actually going inside and causing them to get a blocked ear, like a swimmer's ear, basically. So that's why it's all there. It does a very, very effective job. Roshni agreed. Their ears are very cool. Uh, let's be honest, I thoroughly enjoy spending time with Ellie's, and there's so many things about them that is so different to everything else that you can kind of just watch and marvel at the fact that these things are out here and the way that they are completely kind of suited to their environment, they, their ears, the way that they work, the body structure, the feet, you know, everything about them is is pretty incredible. So they're one of those very special species that has all of these unique traits and has to because of the size that they are and the way that they do their things. They need to be able to do things in a certain manner and that means physiologically they have to have certain changes. But very cool to kind of see this guy moving about thoroughly enjoy spending time with Ellie's and like I say it's quite a unique view for us here at Juma you see this in the Kruger you'll see this a lot you'll drive past Ellie's a lot that will lower than you but here in Juma very very seldom do we have that kind of view of Ellie's and he's probably a little bit kind of wary of um, a bit wary of us being so much higher than what he is um, that's probably why I just moved off a few steps just now Timothy what makes up an elephant herd well, females and their offspring, essentially. Sometimes you'll end up with um, a few bulls in the herd. That's only if there's females that are coming into an estrus. Then you'll find that a few of the bulls will kind of come in and they'll try and vie for, for that female's attention. But for the most part, it's, it's females and their offspring. And that'll include young males. So a male like this would have just been really kicked out over the last few kind of years and will now be on his own but prior to that he would have stayed with the herd probably until he's about 12 to 14 years old and that's when he would have then got chased out and have to go and live by himself but you know mostly females and, and then like I say their direct offspring if in times when you know there's there's certain conditions you'll find that the herds will split or they'll come together and so family groups that have split off might join back with another family group in, in certain times and then in certain conditions and then they'll split out again but you'll always find that within a herd there's definitely direct family groups and that will sometimes be a female with her offspring then you'll find maybe an aunt of hers with a whole bunch of other offspring and they'll kind of just all be within the same herd structure and they kind of separate out when they're feeding and then all together when moving but that's essentially what makes up a herd right our early bull is starting to drift away from us now and we're not going to probably get a better view than what we've had so i think we're going to carry on we'll go try and see what's happening maybe at Bufuzuk Dam and then try and see if we can find little Hosanna and see where he is i have a sneaky suspicion he might have made his way to Bufuzuk Dam during the course of the day and while i do that we're going to send you back across to steve who 
has left Buffalo and is now looking at a herd of wildebeest. Bro, thanks, just in his flyer games. Watch the wildebeest there just to the right of the picture. He just did a whole little body roll in the mud. The animals are all very excited, it seems. Just a bit to the right, he's now rubbing his face on the ground, busy digging it up, rubbing his head. Oh, we're just trying to get a view of him. Come on, everybody, move out the way. Look at them all. They all trying to cover themselves in mud. Uh, something a male wildebeest and hartebeest like to do is cover mud on their horns. It makes them look a lot bigger. It's kind of like people who wear those sort of big jackets make themselves look much bigger. Look how big my biceps are. And they roll around in it. Love the mud. The mud's also quite useful for covering their bodies and uh, keeping away any biting flies that are invariably going to be swarming up after this rain and which have been around for the last little while. So now that the mud and the rain has come, all the animals are quite playful. Um, as we just scan across the plains, the wildebeest looking very cheerful, even though they've got a long face, they still look quite happy with life. We're rolling around in the mud. Last one did a bit of a somersault on his back there. They're all very busy, running around, chasing each other around. Kelsix, that's a great question. Um, I suppose they would. I mean, bison would, would basically just fill uh, the role of, of a grassland species in, in places in South Africa where we have grassland. I'm not sure what, what altitude the bison occur in North America, but I do know that I've seen them getting a winter coat. They get that really, really thick coat, so they're able to survive in very cold temperatures. Um, I wonder what a pride of lions would think of a bison if they saw them. It'd be very interesting indeed. Um, but it's possible that any tick-borne diseases or uh, any vi viruses or diseases transmitted by the animals in Africa would probably floor a bison because they've got no genetic sort of a, a immunity to it. Um, the wildlife you see here has been evolving and dealing with all sorts of hardships for a very, very long time. Uh, even domestic cattle that were brought in have to be excluded from wildlife uh, in many parts of Africa because of the diseases that are transferred. So I'm not sure how well bison would do, but if push came to shove and a place was needed to conserve bison, well, I'm sure we could carve out a piece of area to put them in. I'm just trying to get a glimpse. There's some filled the beast that every now and again I'm doing a little bit of a running around and they're fighting and playing and it's very exciting times in the open. Down towards the back there, James, there's quite a few of them running around. Maybe if we pan in there, we might be able to get a view of a few of them doing stuff because there's all sorts of shenanigans going on at the back there. There we go, it's towards the back there, yeah. Lots of youngsters running around. For some of them it might be the first proper rains that they've experienced or maybe it's the, the excitement that they know the rains bring. Um, the rains will bring all sorts of green flushing from the grass. And it takes the dust away as I said. Makes everything very tasty, very juicy. Very nice herd of wildebeest here, spread out along the plains. Of course, as soon as you frame them, they all stop doing what they were doing. That's the way it is. The zebra are much more reserved when we see them. Okay, well, we're going to move on from these wildebeest and their shenanigans, and while we do so, let's go back down to South Africa and tell him a curdy. Wonderful. It sounds like the Mario Triangle is absolutely filled with wildebeest at the moment, which is epic. I've been seeing some amazing pictures coming out of there, and I'm envious. It sounds like Steve is there at an awesome time. Not that many crossings happening anymore, but it's I can't explain to you how incredible it is to see so many animals in one place. Like, it's like one of the coolest feelings in the whole wide world. So anyways, uh, we had to go back to camp. That's why I've been gone for so long. Our antenna broke on our car. Woo! Luckily, Conrad rescued it and, uh, well, he replaced it, actually. We have a new one now, brand spanking new. So I think what we're going to do is try and continue with our plan on trying to find elephants this afternoon. So. We popped past Treehouse Dam and there was no... Oh, it's Dirk the Daker. Just to the right of the 
Jackalberry tree. Ha ha. We gotcha. We were looking at Dirk this morning. Yes, I must hold on to my phone because this is where also where I thought I'd lost it this morning. There's the Daker that comes out and eats all the jackalberry fruit, much like the elephant with Tristan. They all seem to be enjoying the sweetness. I'm also going to see if we can find some jackalberry fruits today. But there he just stands, hiding away. He thinks we can't see him. We can see you. Busted. And there's lots of little baby Daker around at the moment. What do you call a baby Daker? Does anybody know? Is it a, it's not a lamb. Is it a fawn? Maybe it's a fawn. We'll have to try and work that one out. Because they're so cute, they're so tiny. They're so small. Right, then let's carry on with our search for the elephants this afternoon, though. I think we're going to head into the Mulwai team. We're habituating Dirk the daycare at the moment. See how relaxed he's getting. Now he's run away now. He doesn't like, he really doesn't like vehicles. <laughs> but if you stop there, it's like his comfort zone, then he's fine, then he's okay. But I've stopped in exactly the same spot now this morning and then again this afternoon, which is quite funny. And he's happy when you're that distance away from him. So no point to bother him for too much. Virginia, no, I haven't seen Daryl. I don't know where Daryl is. I'm assuming he's just down Sabi Sabi. That's where he lives. At a lodge or a game reserve just further down south in the Sabi Sands. On the right on the Sabi River. And uh, he loves it there. It's his favorite. There's so much for him to eat. There's swimming pools for him to drink out of. I mean, he has the best time. He loves it. He can annoy everyone, scare the tourists. Uh, th I think it's his favorite. So I don't know where those elephants went. I didn't see their tracks, but I did try and have a look at Treehouse Dam. It didn't look like they went there. So I think we'll go down into the Mulati and then just meander and hope that we bump into them. Maybe they're digging for fresh water. Good afternoon, Impala and Inyala. Welcome, welcome to the Sunset Safari. Anyone doing anything spectacular? Just eating? Just being normal antelope? Yep, just being normal antelope. Okay, we're gonna carry on. Yeah, down we go. And into the Malati we will drive. Hmm. I'm going to keep looking for the jackalberry cheese to see if we can find a tasty snack. Off you go back to Steve and the Mara driving through the herds and herds. Well, we are still moving forward. Everybody seems to have gone straight and not left. So we're wondering if maybe there's some sighting along the way here, or maybe they're all just trying to get this this height, this elevated view of the plane. And all of the wildebeest seem to be gathering around the base or the side of the river here towards the marsh. Really, really incredible. Even if I move slightly towards the end of the road, the whole car slips. So we've got to be very careful today. I was telling you this morning about the what do you call it? The black cotton soils. Well, oh, black cotton soils when they get wet are. Oh very very dangerous just we'll just do a little a little look see over here shall we over the plains and see if you can count them all <laughs> I'm only joking but it is marvelous what's going on I don't know where all these people are going we're gonna have a little ask see that guy's just gone gonna got himself stuck oh there might be some lions off road here some people are going off on a little two track there and we'll ask them and all of the all the animals seem to be accumulating. There's the Mara River and the tree line in the distance. We've got to soak up these shots, folks, because next thing you know, they're all going to be gone. They're all going to disappear. James is a, a bird just in the front check. Can you see him? At your three o'clock, very nice grey heron, oh, black-headed heron, with breeding plumage. Just moving across the screen, well, almost. It's a beautiful view. We'll go back to there's a big elephant in the distance. Elephants really do enjoy the rain. I've always seen them thoroughly soaking it up, loving the mud, the rainfall, the moisture. 
and you can probably hear the pitter patter of the rain has returned and is falling on our heads. Maxi, they weaned after about five months, five to six months at the most. And um, what's very interesting is that all the females will come into sort of a very, very sharp three week breeding period which is not 100% guaranteed the dates, but it happens after the rains. The next ra the rains that we're having now, all the male wildebeest will be in prime condition, so will the females. And within three week window, all of them will be impregnated. Those that aren't, well, they really, really suffer because they basically miss that period of, of fitting in with all the other animals, all of the other youngsters. And as soon as that coloration starts to sort of mismatch the other youngsters, well, then they are prime targets. And pretty much, oh, well, we're going to have to cover up. The rain is now pummeling down. Excuse us. We're going to have to pull down our sides here before we get very, very wet. Okay, well, while we cover ourselves up, Let's go back down to Tristan. <laughs> well, good luck, Steve. When the rains come down in Mara, it gets really quite hectic. And so I'm sure Steve is already getting quite wet, much like Scuba Steve, who is already wet from being in the water. But Scuba's being shy with Snorkel Sarah. The two of them are slowly waddling their way up the bank. That is Bufuzuk Dam. Why are you two leaving at this time of the dam? Are we that bad? Apparently so. They're going to now hide behind a bush. Really are odd, an odd animals. Yes, they don't like us. You're right, Emma. Apparently, we are not friends. It's because we're not James. That's why. You know, Steve, Scuba Steve likes James. He he's very good at listening to James. But exactly, we're just we're not good third wheelers on the romantic date. There they go staggering off. Their legs are so funny. They kind of waddle their way along. And it's amazing actually how fast these guys can move considering. Now that individual looks like she might be pregnant, doesn't she? It seems like that stomach has got a few little bumps in it that it maybe shouldn't have. I wonder if she is. Maybe Snorkel Sarah has a little baby inside. Can you imagine if that is the case? James will be so excited. It'll be like an uncle. I can't see nicely though. It's a bit tricky with hippos to tell if they are, but it just looks like an odd kind of shape in there. It looks like a little bit more swelling than normal. So I'm quite interested to actually just have a little, have a little look around and see if he, she is. Let's see as she goes. You see there's a little bulge just on that kind of left side that's not maybe maybe not I don't know maybe it's just the way the lights hitting her hmm interesting we'll have to do research that one a little bit other than old snorkel Sarah and scuba Steve there's also a large herd of very tall very lofty animals that are cruising around on the other side of Biffles Hook Dam there's a whole bunch of giraffe Galray, she is a submarine and she's, as if she is pregnant, she's going to get more of a submarine very shortly. She's going to become very, very big and very heavy, which is going to make life a little uncomfortable for her. Pretty sure she's going to hope that there's going to be some rain at some point because otherwise her little haunt at Bufalzuk Dam is slowly but surely going to disappear and she's not going to have any space. But it's quite nice to see a herd of giraffe. I mean, we've seen one or two bulls around lately. But we haven't seen too many in the way of females in groups together. So very nice to kind of see a nice grouping. In total, it looks like there's kind of five or six of them. Six is what I can count so far. So nice to kind of see. You can see the males watching towards Bufusuk Dam. He watched the hippos come out. And so he was very intrigued by these animals walking out of the pan. And that's why he's kind of staring down to this direction. It's not because of a predator or anything like that. Giraffe, funny enough, are one of the really good ones when it comes to finding predators, in, in, especially in the Mara. You can use them to your advantage regularly. A giraffe, when it spots something, will curiously look and walk towards it, and it will drag the whole group with them, and they'll all stand there staring, and that's when you know that there's a predator moving around. So if you see them all kind of looking in one direction, then it's a good, good animal to go and follow up on. They generally are not wrong, and generally you can find yourself a predator of some sort. They'll do it for leopard, lion, 
um, wild dogs I've seen them do it as well so they'll kind of anything that moves that can potentially eat meat you'll find that they'll do it for that and I can hear a few go away birds calling is there a bird of prey around yes there we go there's the African hawk eagles that are flying over so the go away birds when they call like that you know that there's a bird, there's something around and there's the two African hawk eagles the pair that are potentially hunting now so the two of them will fly like this you can see they fly quite low so they're gonna hopefully come around that tree fairly shortly and Darby they're quite yeah there we go well done Darby very good work so they kind of fly low to the ground and you see one lower than the other and one a little bit kind of up and as they stoop down they hope to chase things up a little bit and then that other one bombs them from there so both of them are kind of flying along and that's why there was all those alarm calls as they were going but they've moved quite quickly look 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 at that isn't that cool and kind of playing now almost in flight let's see if one of them look at that that's very very cool that's incredible camera work given the how far they are away and how quickly they're moving you've done incredible work there Darby well done that's very very cool you can hear squirrels alarm calling left right and center and go away birds as well not very happy about the presence of these guys good Darby great work right no sign of Hosanna though he's not here which is what I thought might be the case. I think he's still going to make his way here during the course of the day. Now you may notice I'm also in Jigger, which is not really the best news. Poor Rusty has got to go in for its time in the cosmetics shop. It's going to be Rusty is going to be panel beaded and resprayed so it can look quite spiffy once again. So that's now going to be in the shop for a while. And so I'm being relegated to Jigger, which is my least favorite of the fleets. I'm sorry, Jigger, to say this, but you are my least favorite. It feels like a little toy car compared to the others. I don't know why, it just feels a lot smaller and it's quite shuddery. It's like the whole time. So, you know, not that comfortable. So I do apologize if you see stalling and jerky movements. It's not because I want to. It's just that I, Jigger takes a while to get used to. Right, now it sounds like Taylor Maxlacky has decided to join us again this afternoon. So let's send you across to her and see where she's been and what she's been doing while she's had her feet up. What are you talking about? I've been here the whole time, Tristan. Sebastian and I have just been sipping on mojitos. I'm just joking, we have not. <laughs> We're driving down towards to a dam now. I looked for the elephants in the Mulwati, but I could not see them. So I thought, well, where else would the animals come and drink water? Probably Chitwadar. But it doesn't look like there is anything now. I think we might be up for one of those quiet game drives again. Yay! So we'll see. The hippos aren't even lying out of the water today. What a pity. It's always funny to see those big old creatures just sting and sunbathing. is quite nasty. So we could just have a quick look at the hippos and then we'll probably move on unless a herd of elephants decides to come down to have a drink then we will probably stay a little bit but i have no doubt that we're going to see the same things that we always see down here maybe we'll leave the water lizard because it's warm wouldn't that be a treat okay which hippos are we going to look at i don't know if we go down and go find that little baby yeah let's do that Let's go all the way to the other end because I want to see how that tiny little baby hippopotamus is doing. And if, yeah, I think I can see mom still. She likes to rest up near a rock. So it's that hippo over there, Seb. The one on the left. And there's a very, very small baby. So sometimes she gets up and then you, oh, no, hang on, wait, we might, there's a heron. Hello. Green back here and my old friend. Just there on that fallen log. Emma cannot hear what you're saying. Sorry, the comms at Chitwa over the last couple of days have been really bad. But anyway, see we have a green backed heron, which is pretty epic. Now this is an awesome bird and it's got some beautiful light on it at the moment i think that's a really good fishing spot except I, I i think the fish would be a bit more 
intelligent and they'd be able to see that heron perched on that branch it's not really camouflaged in any way whatsoever but it's sitting very very still hoping i think that maybe some fish would come and feed around that branch see it's looking so it must be following something I wonder how many tadpoles are in here. Although, no, actually, no, I don't think there'll be any tadpoles at this time of the year. We haven't really had any raid to bring about the frogs. Although, the last time I was at Chitwa, I did hear them croaking a bit. Come on, catch us something. We sat and watched that saddle build stalk the other day for such a long time, and I was really hoping we were going to get the opportunity. Oh, what did you catch? Nothing! Shame. It must be tiring for them to sit and do this all a day long. Well, for those of you that are fishermen, you do feel the pain. You have those days where you go out for eight hours, perfect weather conditions, and you don't even get a bite. It can be a bit disheartening, but luckily for you, you can just go home or you can stop at a, a you know, burger joint on the way home and grab something to eat. If this heron is unsuccessful at fishing, it's going to be hungry. Let's see, it looks like it wants to strike again. Shorts also enjoying the cool breeze that it's experiencing at the moment. It is actually quite nice, although I think we'll be putting jerseys on a little bit earlier today. Come okay, on, one more attempt. Oh, it's got something. A little something. Maybe there are a few tadpoles swimming around there because it didn't seem particularly big or it could just be a really small school of fish. That is the other option, of course. Oh well. There's even a crocodile just off to the left. Just sitting in the water and a crocodile fast asleep also just enjoying I think the cooler days backs at least getting a bit of sun oh you've opened your eye now hello very very sleepy which is very typical of crocodiles of course just to race like that during the day but the light is beautiful at the moment very very pretty are you waking up? Are you going to move? Are you going to climb out of the water? Because that's always impressive to watch when a crocodile leaves the water. I love watching the way that they walk. Okay, I don't think we've got comms anymore. I have a feeling. No. Let's carry on. Let's get to bear the signal. Oh, there I got comms. Okay, we'll carry on. We'll, we'll try and get closer to that little hippopotamus next time you see us. In the meantime, I'm going to send you to Tristan, who's just on a drive. Well, we are on a drive, but we're making our way slowly to where I left Hosanna this morning. Just trying to quickly get to that two track and then drive in. There's no tracks for Kahim coming out, so I'm pretty sure that's where he's kind of still sitting and sleeping at the moment, is somewhere near here. I'm just also just scanning as we go because he likes these kind of worry thickets where he can sleep ultimately the sun has come out and so i'd expect him to just be in the shade at the moment having a little rest much like yesterday afternoon so let's just see if we get lucky i've just been driving very slowly on hyena road in the hope that i would pick up his tracks and see him crossing here his general direction was this way the whole morning so i'm hoping this is where he kind of came out now he should theoretically if he did come out come out somewhere in this general vicinity no nothing there so Leo you say yes please find the gorgeous cat well we're going to do our very best Leo we're going to try and see if we can find him he doesn't come out on this little two track yeah, I thought he might so let's just take the two track to exactly where I had him and see if I can find him where we left him because he was very fast asleep when we did the problem was is he was lying right out in the open so he's definitely gonna have moved a little bit to find some shade but there was a really nice termite mound right there with some nice shade on it so he might have just moved straight to that right now I'm gonna keep moving towards where it is it's gonna take me probably a good five minutes to get there so while I do that though let's send you back across to Steve who's just hunkered down under his rain covers
Well, welcome to the tent. We are we are covered. The rain seems to be uh, dropping. We followed a few vehicles, but the rain's still falling. We're trying to just position ourselves. There are some lions just over there, but um, moving the vehicle here is very, very tricky. So we're just going to try to find out exactly where they are. We've just arrived in the place. Black cotton soil everywhere. So there's going to be no off-road driving at all. I've figured out exactly why we've got one of these in the car. This is our windscreen wiper. Uh, <laughs> so I've put it to good use and I've, I was able to see on our way off-road here. But we're going to try and reposition ourselves so that we're able to access and to get a visual of these lines. Philip, you want to know how much of the mar is black cotton? Um, well, along the river itself, it's very alluvial sort of plain along the river. So that's a mixture of alluvial soil, which could also have come from granites up in the mountain and different sandy soils, but it's also got some, some clay in it. And then these sort of low-lying areas below the Olalula range is completely black cotton soil, and then further to the, uh, to the south as well. So quite a, a large, large proportion of it. And then there's also the, um, the Inselberg, so the granite sort of heads that pop out. But from a percentage-wise, I'm sorry, I can't tell you. We're just going to move in here. One vehicle's moved out. We're going to try and take his place and hopefully out of the windows that James has got on either side of the vehicle. And we'll be able to have a look at where these lions are. Very good. Bear with us, folks. We are trying. Trying to get you a nice view. Don't know who they are. Don't know exactly where they are either. But I'm sure in a moment we'll be able to spot them. Everything just slides in here. It's very, very distressing, in fact. James, I'm going to try and position you like that with your open window. Reverse. See, reverse. See, now James can see and I can't see. James is just telling me exactly where he wants me. Teresa, they are indeed cracks. They would not probably pass the health and safety of a main road driving in South Africa. James is asking me to just move forward a little bit. We're just trying to get you some lines that are... Oh, here, yeah, I can see one over here, James, coming towards us. Are you good? Okay, hopefully James can get you a line. There we go. So Teresa, the, the, the mirror or the window is probably broken due to the fact that, um, you know, to release it, I just have to push it forward and then it falls onto the bonnet. And I'm sure over a period of time, it bounces or it's been dropped once or twice. And well, glass, it doesn't like being smashed. And so that is what's led to the window being cracked. I have no doubt. I've seen it happen many times in the past. Um, also, if you drive too fast with vehicles like these, not saying that this has been driven too fast, the, the window can bounce a lot on uh, <laughs> on the frame in front there. And well, that's that's why many of the vehicles I've used in my life, we just completely remove this window because oh, there we go. They've got something. Well, they've got something. Very good. Well, they have got something to eat, folks, and um, I don't know who these animals are. It looks to me by the colour that it might be a wildebeest, but um, I'm not sure. It's in the long grass. Okay, well, while we see exactly what's going on in this sighting, let's go back down to Taylor, who's got some very cute little hippos. We do, but the cute little thing doesn't want to show itself. It's hiding away quite well. Mom is very protective. Every single time we come out here, she stands up and she shows herself to us, basically just saying, if you dare come any closer to the water's edge, you will feel my wrath. But luckily, we're not interested in getting too close to her, so that's okay. I haven't actually seen much of the little baby. In fact, she's sort of kept it hidden. But it is there. It pops up every now and then but not too often. And now uh, I've also just been looking. Oh, wood sandpiper. What is that? Oh my goodness, Wendy, I've completely forgotten the gestation period. I think it's like 
is it 257 days? Isn't it like eight months? I have to check quickly. I've forgotten. I don't know why. Um, I've forgotten the gestation period of a hippopotamus. Can you believe it? It's something that you learn. Oh, okay, I was close. So how, what is that? How many months is that? How many months is that? Who wants to do me maths? Yeah, it is eight months. Okay, so I was right there. It's just wrong with the day. So it's about, yes, eight, give or take, eight, eight and a half months or so around there. So um, and they carry for quite some time. Man, it's, I promise you, it's one of the hardest things when you don't talk about gestation periods all the time. And I find when you're doing normal guiding, you tend to talk about it a lot more frequently because, well, let's be honest, you know, you have guests that come through every three to four days, so there's a lot of repeating um, some of the general stuff and weights and gestation periods are one of them. We don't actually talk too much about the gestation periods. They pop up every now and then. So it's always funny to try try and remember all of them. They do test you on them a lot when you do all your, your guide training initially. So I want to show you something. Can we pan up to the camp, all that green grass? So we haven't talked about how the camps irrigate um, inside and they normally have some kind of fence to keep the animals out. That is how well a fence works. <laughs> they will find a way in. The Inyala specialists, they're like, we're getting in there, we're eating all the nice green plants. And then I even saw a warthog just up and to the left as well, munching away on the green grass. It's just below the day there he is in the corner. Uh, go up a bit in the camp. There we go, you can just see its tail. So I'm sure there's a few more of them all munching away having the best time of their lives and it's funny because they're never there when the guests are in camp or any of the staff are around because they tend to try and escort them out and back into the wilderness but as soon as everybody leaves they're quick to go back inside so funny how they've learned safari times too because they'll they only start coming back towards the lodge you know, sort of just after high tea or uh, yeah normally or early in the morning when no one is up just yet after the guests have gone out on safari so i always find that quite funny to watch all the animals around there. Wonderful. Well, unfortunately, Chitwa Dam is not particularly exciting today, so we are going to vacate from this area. We... No elephants have come down to drink, sadly. Oh, woe is me. Okay, well, I think we might pop back towards Juma now, I think, and go maybe goes happening down there. I'm not sure who it goes to, but somebody that's looking for elephants. Well, you're back with us, folks. We've managed to raise the one side of our vehicle flap. I can now officially see what's going on. I was feeling a little bit claustrophobic in there. The rain hopefully has moved off for now, but we'll leave the rest of the roof as it is. We have now got a great position, well, as good as we're going to get, of this pride of lions that are eating what the leg would tell me to be a wildebeest. Now, because of where we are, just below, really, the, the escarpment, not far from camp at all. This is very likely the Olololo pride. Isabella, do any animals like the rain? Well, I can tell you for sure that elephants and um, hippopotamuses, they like the rain. Lions, often when it is rainy, they just sort of buckle down and just accept it. They don't seem to enjoy it very well. But what the rain often can bring, especially a thunderstorm, is it can bring wind. And with the wind brings stealthy movement for them. So often you'll find lions hunting the leopards as well when the wind picks up. And not necessarily are they a, a fan of the rain. But there we go. You can see the full belly. A full belly in the wetness, well, they'll do... That'll satisfy them, but no, these cats do not like really, don't like water. And often you'll find them just sort of sulking down. James, there's another lion over there just popping its head over the edge. Can you see it? Just there to the right. To the right over there at about two o'clock, half past two. Now, I don't know where that lion has come from. Maybe it's a different pride. Maybe it's part of the same pride. The way it's looking, that's quite interested and probably hasn't known about the kill that's going on at the moment. Let's see what happens if it tries to come any closer, if it is in fact part of this pride. Uh, if it is, it will be received well. Ah, oh, it's lying down. Well, that wasn't very exciting. Sorry about the build-up. It could have gone any way. 
normally when you see a cat looking like that, it kind of had that sort of that lion interesting look on its face looking over. If it was definitely part of the pride, you know it would run in. If it hasn't eaten already, it would run in and get involved. But if it's another animal, another pride individual, well, they come in very tentatively as they start to figure out what exactly is going on, who's there, how many, and uh, is it worth the risk? And a single lioness on their own, well, no real chance of them getting involved with the pride. Even though this one does have a few youngsters in it, that's quite a, that's a youngster. Similar sort of age to one of the uh, Onkohuma young females, maybe a little bit younger. But just through the numbers, it can't be the Wiener Pride. The Wiener Pride's got three adults. Or was it two? It's two adults, eh, hey, James? Yeah, two adults and three youngsters. So there's already more than six animals here. So it really can't be the Wiener, although we've had the Wiener in the area not far away. Maybe those two youngsters we saw the other day were in fact part of this pride. Let's see if we can spot them. We will be photobombed in a minute, I'm afraid, by a vehicle that's going to come past us. Oh, they're going to choose the other route. How fantastic of them. So you can just see how much these animals are getting to eat. There's no squabbling, but no real sort of animosity towards each other. There, that youngster off to the right. We saw two individuals about that sort of age the other day that kind of disappeared and hid in the thickets. Don't forget, folks, there we go, there's a bit of territorial demarcation from the female. Bear in mind, females, the lionesses defend territories, and males, well, they defend prides, defend females. Don't forget, folks, this is an interactive game drive safari. We'd love to hear from you either on the Twitter hashtag, Safari Live, or jump in on the YouTube chat stream. Don't forget the all-important at FC. Keep your comments towards lions with regards to me, and we will definitely answer them. All other relevant questions, obviously, towards Tristan and Taylor could find themselves being answered. Beautiful lions these are. She is a gorgeous lioness. Absolutely gorgeous. Her nose is a little bit dirty, probably from some mud. But it doesn't look like there's been a feeding frenzy. Can you see how clean her face is? Clean her chest and body. It's possible that she moved in on a kill that one of her sisters had caught. Teresa, well, one wildebeest should be enough for six, seven lions. Um, it doesn't mean that it will be enough. It should be enough. But lions, in, in their own right, they just, when times are plenty, they will just catch and catch and catch. The other day, we didn't manage to catch up with them, but we were told of a lioness and a male that killed three wildebeest in the space of about half an hour or so, one after the other. Um, I've seen a similar thing before in the past where a lioness was kind of... You know, there was this muddy wallow with just a little bit of water, and then parlor herd just kept coming down. And I saw her in the space of about two and a half hours kill six in parlor. She didn't eat one of them. She just dragged them up this little, little drainage culvert towards where her cubs and her injured sister were. And she went back to her same position, and more in parlor came, and she just kept killing. So six that I saw in the space of about three, three hours or so. So they just can't help themselves sometimes. Um, when time's in a plenty, there we go, what's going on? Oh, she's running in. Another lioness who's just realized that there's something on the go has come running in. She looks like she's full though. She's been, eat been eating somewhere else. You see, she can't help herself. <laughs> what's going on here, everybody? There's food. <laughs> and that other one at the back's now coming forward, James. That might be interesting. Sitting Bull, what you saw there a moment ago with that female rubbing and kicking her back legs and urinating is lion's scent marking. Um, they don't necessarily do it, as far as I'm aware, the same way that leopards or male lions do by walking and doing that backwards. Oh, hang on. There's all sorts of play happening up a front here. There's one lioness coming in from the back. We want to see what she's doing. You see that? Is it a lioness? See the interest? If she was part of this pride, I think she would have come running in already. I think she might be trying to suss out... What's going on? So lionesses and lions, they do, they kind of just spray backwards. They urinate on the floor and they kick it, uh, but they also have the ability to uh, scent mark backwards like leopards do. I've never seen a lioness physically doing that before. I often see them just scratching their back legs and urinating pretty much on their feet, but I believe lionesses are able to do that. Okay, let's see if anything's happening here. This lion is coming in very slowly from the side. 
The lions just keep coming. Okay, let's have a look. She's slowly coming in. Let's see how she's received. They can recognize each other quite quickly, which I find quite incredible. A lion knows exactly whether it's friend or foe from a distance. Let's see how she's coming in. Okay, there's some, there's some sort of love shown there, or a little bit. Is she welcome? Look at all the ones lying on the ground. Look at the checking her out. Oh, I think we could always invite some people on board. It's been raining in the Mara. There are lions on a kill. Who knows what could happen next? See, she's a bit tentative. She's not very well accepted, is she? Look at that facial expression. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Mara Triangle up in Kenya. We are with a pride of lion that have, we're not sure how long ago, killed what we believe to be a wildebeest. And one by one, more lion seem to just be materializing on the scene. Feeding is still taking place. Please, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to throw them in onto the chat stream just below. Love to hear from you. Love to know where you're from, what's going on. There is one lion that has clearly had its fill already and looks practically dead in the grass. Tawny coloration, we had a thunderstorm, lightning and rainfall, and that's possibly assisted these lions in catching something to eat. Welcome, welcome, Karibu, Sana, my name is Steve. I'm joined by Big James on camera, and we're not sure who these are. Um, we're gonna keep having a look, see if we can get a good gri grip to who they are exactly, where they are, and the number of them, the number keeps growing. I've got at least eight lions that have counted now of different ages. There's a little bit of growling going on in the, in the scene there. Some have clearly fed already and moved off and others have moved in. There's a time of plenty up here at the moment in the migration. Plains abound with animals. James, the kill could be more than one day old, um, seeing as the fact that some of the lions, as they're feeding, are not even getting any blood on them, which means that a lot of the blood has dried up or drizzled out. Um, the individuals that we saw moments before that had stood up and were facing us were clean, even after eating, which generally implies that the kill has been around for a little while. Um, you can see it's still going on over there. You just see ears in the grass. Maybe they were attracted to the sounds of the feeding, but also that blood can drain quite quickly. It's just a matter of hours, and a lion doesn't get too dirty when they eat. Um, but who knows? We weren't here. We were attracted in by other vehicles that clearly had been given communication about what was going on. So we followed them like vultures, and here we are in the scene trying to figure out who they are, and considering where they are and the number of them, it could possibly be the Olololo pride. But I say that just out of um, sort of a, a bit of a thumb suck. It's kind of a working out of where we are. We're close to the Olololo range, nearby to where this pride is commonly seen. Hello, Elijah. Well, it's very hard to really give a, a season to what we are at the moment because we're quite close to the equator, um, but it's not winter. We definitely in the in the southern hemisphere is, is summer, is spring and summer. So up here, it's very interesting to try and figure out what season it is. It's pretty much equal temperatures and daylight hours all throughout the year here up in the Mara Triangle. So you kind of got quite a nice sort of balance with regards to temperature and season, but we are coming into what Kenya is familiar with, the big, or the second rains, which is the small rains that come from October through to December, and this afternoon provided the first thunderstorms of that. Got a few youngsters, you see, see all their heads popped up there, you see they're quite young, those three with their heads up, they aren't bloody, can you see that? If it was a fresh kill, there would be blood all over the chest and face. Isabella, well, they do look quite full, and after a little bit of eating, lion, this is a big lioness right here. Hello, girl. Wow, it's right next to the car. That is incredible. 
you always forget how big these cats are until they come right next to you. You see the size of those feet. She's incredible. Anyway, she's one of the mums. Here's one of the young males. He looks like a male. Have a look at our barrel. Belly D is there. He's been eating. You know, my boys like to eat a lot. My brother and I, when we left home, my mum saved an absolute fortune. Look at that belly. He looks like a young male. I just thought that initially. I'm not 100% sure. You can see the spots on the back of his leg. The lions, and we all got other vehicles in the sighting. This is the Mara Triangle. There are lots of, of companies and safari groups out here with their guests, with their viewers, just like you. People come here from all over the world to witness these animals in the migration, and we're going to have a walk by in a moment of a lion right over here. And I say it's a young male, just because he's got a little bit of fur around the neck. Don't look at me like that, young sir. I'll have a look now. Yes, he's got the two golden jewels below the tail. And here comes another one. Having a little having a little sniff of the vehicle. What do we smell like there? Makesh, wow, indeed. Doesn't matter how many times you do this, it is always sensational to spend time with lions. And, uh, well, they're going to grace all of you with their presence. And they're going to come and walk directly past the car, as you do. Here comes a lioness. Look at her. Look at the power in that chest. She's obviously spotted one of her sisters and she's feeling a little bit energized, a little bit older than the others that you saw. A big female. They're not bothered by the vehicle. They habituated the vehicles up in these areas. Uh, they're not going to jump on board. It doesn't happen. Salome, the biggest threat to lions really is habitat loss and uh, encroachment of human uh, sort of life style and livestock in and around reserves. So uh, lions are const uh, restricted to conservation areas, but then towards lions inside these national areas, lions are their threat and hyena, large clan of hyena, which we get in these areas. Lots and lots and lots of hyena occur around here. And um, I think the lions are all playing on the other side. So those guys are still feeding. And the others have gone off to have a little bit of a drink. We'll have a look. Hopefully that one's going to pop the leg up in the air for you for a moment. And that is the only reason I could tell it was a wildebeest. But while they gnaw on the remainder of their dinner, thank you for joining us. It has been wonderful having you on this very short broadcast this afternoon. I hope you have a beautiful day further. We are still live for another hour and a half or two hours. Please feel free. Join us on, hashtag on Safari Live. Just Google us on YouTube and we'll catch you later. Have a beautiful evening. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for bearing with us. Always so special when a lion walks past the car. Never get, never gets old. Never gets old. Now, obviously, the ones that have walked past are possibly playing on the other side here. Yeah? I think they might be walking off somewhere to go and have a bit of a drink. But uh, we've got half of our canopy closed on one side because of the rain. Um, but very, very special indeed to be spending this time with these lions. They are just. I don't know how many to count now. What four walk past the car? That's five, six. Let's see if I can zoom in there and get another. There's at least ten animals here. Okay, well we're going to stay here. You see what else goes on in the sighting. In the meantime, let's go back down to Tristan who's on the move. I am indeed. So we went to where we last had Hosano. Found where he had slept in the shade for most of the day and then he moved by the looks of things kind of from there in a easterly southeasterly direction but i can't find any tracks crossing hyena road so he's somewhere in that block at the moment so i'm just going to give it a bit of time we'll wait until a little bit later i'm sure he's going to go towards buffalzook dam and hopefully we'll just catch him somewhere there maybe hear an alarm call or something like that a little bit later but we have got nyala so maybe we'll find Hosanna somewhere around generally when there's an antelope walking his wide eyes are watching somewhere <laughs> nearby no I'm joking it's not as bad as that but nice to see this Nyala I'm surprised it's on its own I thought there would have maybe been some others around unless they round the bend here then I just can't see them but it looks like it's all by itself which is quite strange we don't really tend to see Nyala on their own unless of course she wanted to go at lamb but she doesn't look heavily pregnant or like she's got even suckle marks. No, it doesn't look like it. 
Why are you on your own, little Nyala? Where is the rest of your herd? Hmm, no way to be seen. It's quite interesting. There's something dangling from her tail there, David. I thought I saw something kind of just dangling from the base end of her tail when she was walking. I know they have a very sort of floppy tip to the tail. Let's see. No, it's just her tail. It's kind of like that. It just looks a bit funny. I thought for a second maybe she might have had a bit of afterbirth, which would have been quite interesting, but that would have then explained why she was on her own when they've got a bit of afterbirth hanging out. They sometimes have just had their little one, and the little one stays stashed, hidden away. But I think it's just her tail. Is it just her tail? Has her tail lost the tip or lost the hair on the end? This definitely doesn't look right. Yes, it's lost all the hair on the end. No wonder it looks odd. What have you done to the tip of your tail, Nyala? Yes, you might be right, Emma. Maybe Hosanna just missed and grabbed the tip and took fur off, just sheared it. Or maybe that's the new look in the Nyala world. This is the fashion for the spring and summer collection, is the shaved tip of tail. Maybe that's what it is. Who knows? Quite tricky to get the tip of a Nyala's tail. I wonder if it's maybe a bit of mange or something. You can that it's got. You see, it almost looks like it's got a bit of mange on its kind of buttocks area. Weird though. Very very odd. Normally that's quite fluffy eh, towards the end there, but this particular one has lost all its fluff. Shame, girl. You seem to be all right though. It doesn't seem to be in poor condition at all. Right. Now, while I kind of keep meandering about seeing what else is out here and seeing whether or not we can find this little spotted cat, let's send you back across to Taylor, who is caught up with the two Mungain boys at the pan. We have indeed caught up with the lions at the pan. They've just finished a nice drink, but perhaps you were watching on the, on the dam cam. But they're now fast asleep back in the shade, so They've given up what was what little was left of that warthog carcass and left it to the vultures. They were swooping on in, happy to just get a very, very small snack. And now, I think it's just going to be a couple more hours of rest before they eventually decide to get up. And maybe, I don't know where they're going to go. I think they're probably going to try and find the Inkahuma Pride a little bit later. Um, so that is probably what's going to happen I'm just gonna quickly reposition I just want to move sorry Seb I just want to move away from the other guests that are talking loudly so we'll just go park around over here there we go that's a bit better a little bit more quieter sorry I find it particularly difficult to try and talk and present and then also not listen to what other people are saying on this fire vehicles so i have to remove myself from the situation um minamu it, it, it that's not an easy thing to answer it's not kind of a straightforward answer with regards to who eats f or who in a pride eats first at a kill i think it depends on the pride dynamics so every pride will be slightly different if there's big males around they might throw their weight a bit and uh, then try and eat first otherwise if there's young cubs after the adults have normally had a bit of a bite to eat and they've brought them in and then the cubs can eat fairly soon but if the cubs are nearby they can come running on in and start eating with the adults and the females are typically quite tolerant of them but the males if the big males are there they're not going to you know really be interested in them at all um but with these two young boys it's difficult to say because they're kind of not really a part of the pride what is that cut i did see one was walking around with a bit of a limp there's a slight gash there well, that could have really been caused by anything that could be an injury from another lion perhaps there were no scrap maybe when the evoker males came through they won't be too happy that uh you know that these boys are in the pride with the Inkahumas they would have ch tried to chase them away it could have been an injury from anything really just running and getting caught on a branch mm. Tom, I suppose in a very, very small aspect that the oxpeckers might help 
with getting rid of the mage. They'll eat the mite eggs, they'll eat the mites if they're up and on the surface of the skin. Typically the mites burrow underneath the surface of the skin. So it is difficult for for some for like something like a bird to kind of uh, uh, just sort of eat it, but the mite eggs possibly yes, but um, what really needs to happen is they just need to get fit and healthy again and groom themselves. Cleaning is super important because once they start cleaning themselves, hopefully it'll all kind of heal up, but they'll be okay. I think they'll be fine. At least they're getting the odd meal here and there, so that's good. Bellies are nice and full and that will definitely help them. So you can see the mange isn't taking away their hunger. So as long as they're still hungry, hungry, hungry lions and wanting to feed, then they'll be okay. Problem comes in when they all of a sudden lose their appetite, then you know there's something severely wrong with them. But that's not the case, so we don't need to panic and I don't think we need to panic at all. They'll, like I said, they will be fine. Mange is so common out in the wild, it happens all the time. You might find that you, you on quite a few different species of animals, you'll find um, some some of the mange mites living in the surface of the skin but because they're so healthy you know they might not be making too much of a an impact on them so i wonder where young hosana has gone i don't know if he's come this way i don't know if he'd want to mess with these two young boys they'd probably chase him around a little bit i don't think they would take too likely to or too kindly sorry to his presence look at those bellies though shame just staring up at the sky now in the shade bellies are so full i bet they feel good though if only they had something to relieve that itch right off you go back down to steve who's also got lions but they are feasting we do indeed well done i don't know who the mangeba boys are is that what they were called very interesting. I heard that this morning and I've never heard of them. Well, we are with what James is assuring me must be the Olalola Pride. And um, the group that was feeding is still there. They're not that hungry as comes with prides when they are hungry. There's lots of action and, and thrashing around. They're all, well, just having a little bit of fun. Generally what happens when food becomes scarce and bellies are empty there's a lot more competition around the kill site, especially when you're as many numbers as this. Mm, child of the universe, I have so far counted three lioness. I will let you know once I get a little a better view at the rest. That looks like it looks like another lioness there to the right of the picture. So that would be four. And um, then seemingly the rest so far. Oh, made up of youngsters, but I don't know this pride. James, how many adults are you familiar with in this pride? Excuse me. So James says there's 14 in the pride. Um, I remember seeing them back in February with Jamie on my first drive out with her. We were coming down the escarpment and we got the Olalola pride sort of playing around with a herd of buffalo, but it wasn't the adults, it was the youngsters. And the buffalo were having none of it. So I don't know right offhand at the moment. Definitely four lioness for the moment. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I'm counting nine youngsters. So maybe there's a fifth lioness in there somewhere. I will let you know as soon as I get a proper look. But um, you're seeing exactly what I'm seeing. They're quite flat down in the grass there. But no doubt after they've finished eating, we might get a bit more movement. There's some calling happening behind us. Let's just have a listen. It wasn't some very loud calling. She called a few times and then she stopped. Poofy poof, you want to know how many lion cubs can be sustained in a pride. It really depends on the food availability. I mean, sometimes 16 to 20 youngsters can be facilitated, but then feeding gets very, very tricky. Up here in the Mara, I think due to the abundance of prey, 
um, the lion prides can sustain themselves a little bit better. But as soon as food becomes scarce, a pride that might have been successful, so maybe five or six females all have cubs, the next thing there's, a, there's 20, 24, 25 in the pride, suddenly uh, those youngsters become adolescent, so they become sub-adult, two, three years of age, the competition becomes quite fierce, and well then the lioness will split up taking their relevant cubs with them, and that's when you get breakaway prides, you get prides splitting up, moving off. Okay, let's have a listen, there's a lioness just calling right here, contact calling, coming into picture on the right here, James. It's just a little bit of a of our roof in the way. You can get her now, I'm sure. She's just here. So that's who she's contact calling for. I don't know. Getting the tension of her sister. One, two, three, four, five. So I've now counted five adult lioness. A few of them are spread out off to back of the screen towards the right two are moving down towards the lugger at the back there a little bit more right James you'll see that one's just disappearing down to the drainage just there one was just in front of her and this is a youngster towards the right a young female that walked past us not so long ago they're probably gonna go down there and have a little drink thirsty business eating all this meat Okay, Mangen. Mangen males is the name. I apologize for the mispronunciation, but Taylor is still with them. Let's go and have a look. We are the fast asleep. I think just enjoying the afternoon sun. I'm kind of envious. I wish I could be these lions right now, except for the mange part. I could probably do without that. As I don't know if I'd be tolerate being so itchy all of the time. But they don't seem to be scratching too much. That's actually something I've noticed. I've seen them scratch once or twice. But when you used to watch the sticks pride, and when they were infested with mange, I definitely think some of those young cubs, it unfortunately turned into psychoptic mange. It got quite bad. And they were super, super itchy. And even the Inkuhuma youngsters, they overcame it. But now there is a young elephant. I think it's a young elephant bull in the distance that's arrived. Well, is arriving. So this could get quite interesting a little bit later. He's still very far away, just nibbling away. So I, I don't know if this is maybe the same elephant. It looks like its mouth is a bit wet, so maybe it has already had a drink. But who knows, if you're in the area and there's nice, fresh, cool water around on a hot afternoon, why would you not have a second sip of water? I know I, I often go in for a, a double glass of ice-cold water, except we don't have ice in camp, which is a disaster. Absolute crisis. What are we going to do, Sebastian? I don't know. Can someone send ice? SOS, send ice. <laughs> Jerry did say she was going to get on the ice machine, but that ice machine really doesn't make ice very well. So, I mean, it's just a machine. A water machine. <laughs> it's honestly... <laughs> Anyways. But, but yes, if anybody's flying over the Sabi sand, please drop boxes of ice for us, please. Please, please, please. Anyways, this Eddie is just having a grand old time munching away over there. And then we've also got some guinea fowl. They're just down where Weird's little dad once used to be. When it used to have water in it. I think they're all just moving along, looking for things to peck at. They might come and have a drink, which would be quite cool. I hope that they don't mind us sitting here, though. Because I would like to get some nice pictures, hey? Some nice drinking pictures of guinea fowl with this beautiful afternoon light i think it would be quite nice i don't have really good guinea fowl pictures so we need to work on that and i think we've got a good spot from here because if hosanna does go walking through we'll hopefully see him oh now Alyssa, um we'll just watch this elf ellie bull as i answer the question this little pan i don't think there's too many fish in here i'm sure there's a few and um, they would have been transported here by mainly aquatic birds so anything from sandpipers to three banded plovers to egyptian geese and other things that might wander around there the eggs normally get latched onto the legs and that's how they typically will transport 
um, the eggs but I, I don't know what fish will be in here I haven't actually ever seen any fish in this pan so whether there are any little tilapia or the odd catfish I'm not sure lots of insect life though I'm sure plenty mosquito larvae uh, I'm sure the odd water scorpions living in there there's definitely a few terrapins which you can see their heads uh, just popping up and poking above the water and they swim swim around I think, I think they're missing remember Henry the hippo I think they miss him so much he used to live here he was a lovely hippopotamus. He could have been my favorite hippopotamus. And the terrapins all used to sit on his back. They were great friends. But now they've got no friends. Now they've got to be friends with other terrapins. Sometimes they annoy the buffalo and the buffalo come through here and sit in the pan. Uh, they, they get very upset. There's someone that's coming down for a drink though. It's a turtle dove. Hello, very pretty. trying to find the right place to come and have a drink delicious that's the best way to have a drink is just stick your entire face in ah well it seems as though Steve is having a fabulous afternoon barring the sudden downpours the lions don't seem to mind the rain Yes, well, five of the lions all went across the river, the drainage, and, well, there's three of them at the moment, and it seems like they made another kill as well earlier. That's probably where that one lioness came and joined them from when she came through the drainage. And there is another wildebeest there in the long grass that so far three have come to and two more are on the way. One's coming running from the side. Be ready for it. It's about to join from the right. Boom, there she goes. <laughs> Looks like a wildebeest leg. There's a wildebeest jumping, the brocking, the bonco at the back there. Hmm, there's that lioness going forward. See, she's scratching her feet. And one on the left, scratching her feet, doing some urine spraying. Territorial behavior. And that wall of wildebeest on the other side. We can just hear them. Oh, oh, oh. No, that, this was obviously there before. We saw a few lioness moving off, so it didn't happen right in the shot, but it probably happened before we got here. So, basically, while the ones were eating this one, others were eating that one, and then they all came and joined this side. And now, well, some of them realized, well, we've got meat that side. Let's go back again. Now, it is a time of plenty for lions, folks. And, um, well, off to the left, James, and that lioness is stalking again. Just to the left of the tree now. A bit more left. You see there's another... She's going again. So they can't help themselves. Someone was saying earlier, is one going to be enough? Well, clearly two is not enough. When the, the food is available, they just go and go and go. We're going to stay right here, see what happens. And bearing in mind, folks, with lions this time of year the wildebeest are far easier to catch because they always think that someone else is watching when actually no one's watching as you can see she's getting closer and no one has a clue that she's coming child of the universe possibly different tastes maybe an older and a younger one maybe this one was a bit more veal the side and on the other side it was a little bit more mutton <laughs> it's hard to say but um, she's definitely looking. Look at the posture. I'm just keeping my eyes on the others to see if they're going to get involved. At the moment, they're busy eating. There's a second one about to join her coming from the back. Don't think those wildebeest have spotted her. Look at that. Just see the ears. If we didn't know she was there, you would look right past her, wouldn't you? And there's a second lioness just creeping up behind her. Who knows if they're going to catch anything. I don't want to move. I mean, we can't do any off-road driving in this area anyway. But um, this is all beautiful with a nice long lens and a very wide-angled camera. We're able to capture these images from a good 300 meters away, I'd say. Maybe less, 200 meters. Lots of the vehicles around us are deciding to leave. You might be hearing the noises of them driving past. Mm, wonderful, the bear seems to have spotted. No, he's not too concerned.
proud cat mama lions and most predators essentially the importance in the ecosystem is they pick off the weak the old and the infirm sometimes the young as well and so what it forces it forces an evolutionary sort of adaptation for the animals to breed only strong genes uh, the weak do not breed they get picked off out of the population and their their poor genetics die with them um, so that is exactly what predators do um, it is a natural cropping of the system obviously every now and again they get healthy individuals but when you see the number of wildebeest that are around it really doesn't make too much of a difference but invariably the lion and the hyena will select the easiest that there is to catch um, or something that's got a limp or maybe a deformity or one that's just not fast enough to keep up and so they keep the population in a breeding sort of stage of highly sort of strong individuals they keep the breeding success or the the genetics in check and that is across the board with regards to predators and that's why it's important to have all the different layers as well not just lions you need the lion you need the hyena you need the jackal you need the meso predators in the form of the jackal and the serval all there to be preying on other individuals in North America they've seen huge changes in sort of animal diversity due to coyotes being either present or absent um, and wolves being present or absent. The, the, the deer com populations completely skyrocketed. There's a third lioness joining. And if you, if you have coyotes and you don't have the smaller sort of badger-like animals, then you get a rodent increase. And it's all very important to have the balance, the predator balance in the, in the environment. They will always balance what's going on out there and obviously their population, predator population, can't skyrocket like that of the prey animals. Um, they kind of just breed when they can and their numbers never really shoot up too high and if the population of the prey crashes, well the predator population will drop but they can never get too high that they overpopulate or over harvest uh, the prey. There's no way they would be too much of a dent in the wildebeest but in the wildebeest breeding down in the south moving up here there's a constant steady offtake of their populations from from young until old okay well we're going to stay here and see if any action happens with these lionesses disappearing in the long grass but in the meantime let's go to Tristan for an update well hopefully you do get some action sounds like you're having a, at least a decent sighting anyway far more than what we've had. We had a, a beautiful lilac breasted roller very 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 briefly that came down and grabbed an insect and then half choked to death trying to swallow it and then eventually got it down and flew off so that was quite nice. But other than that very quiet no real updates on the radio either so I'm not sure where to go from here? I think I'm going to try and head slowly towards, back towards kind of Biffleswick Dam area, try and check around those sections. Maybe I'll strike gold and find little Hosanna making his way there. It's around this time of the day that he theoretically should be heading in that direction. He likes to kind of move around just as the sun sets. We saw it yesterday. He slept until just as around about half past five and then he started to move so we've got a bit of time until half past five but we're just going to slowly putter our way along we'll do that road that runs along the drainage line to Buffalo Dam around the fire break and then back towards the dam and hopefully sit there for a bit and listen for some alarm calls so James Richard uh, mm, the vulture's nest is on the opposite side of the reserve from where I am um, if we really don't have much luck we can try swing past it otherwise I will do my very best to swing past there tomorrow um, if that's okay, if we can make that deal. Um, like I say, I'm a little bit far out from it now. I mean, I might make it. Oh, there's an owl. See it there, David. Hello, owl. Is it a pearl-spotted owlet or a bard? No, it's a pearl-spotted owlet that is there, which is very, very cool. We've had some good luck with pearl-spotted owlets over the past few days. They've been all over the place, and since Taylor laid down that challenge, we've had quite a few. We had one this morning, we had this one, and we had three the other night. So really very, very good. Nice to see a healthy population of owls. And these guys are out at this time of the day. You often see them milling about at sunset and sunrise. They will still hunt at that time and then obviously into the night. Um, so they're a little bit more diurnal than a lot of, or I suppose crepuscular is probably a better word, than some of the other owl species that we get. But very pretty little things. I absolutely love their kind of 
look and, and they are tiny they really are small it's difficult to get a sense of scale there but they are i mean they're only about 15 centimeters which is absolutely tiny now i think a tax is trying to call me i think yeah go ahead there it goes. Uh, but i'm right here i'll see you now so we didn't have to wait long hosan is at Bifuzuk dam <laughs> So our plan was right, so somebody beat us there, so we knew he would arrive there at some point um, It's just a matter of time, so we knew he'd arrive eventually But hopefully he's going to sit on the dam wall and give us a really spectacular sunset on the dam wall That's what I'm hoping, he's such a epic cat when he does those kind of things that I'm hoping that's going to be the case Right, now while I head off there, I'm not far, I'm about two minutes away, let's send you back to Taylor McCurdy and to see how those lions are enjoying this afternoon sunshine. Go, go Tristan, race as fast as you can. Go visit young Horsada and see what he's doing, what he's been up to for the entire day. Now we're still sitting with the lions, they're fast asleep. Sometimes they roll over and they show us their enormous bellies, but most of the time they're just relaxing, just going about their day, which is fair enough. I can hear a safari vehicle. Where are they going? Are they coming to us or are they going to Osana? Well, Jay Smooth, unfortunately, I think the, these male lines, it's going to be quite some time before they actually get their manes. But normally at about, from quite young actually, from about eight months old, you start to see that their hair on, the, on their chest, essentially, just underneath their, their, their neck, all the way down their neck into their chest, you start to see the hair becomes a little bit longer. But it, it's just kind of noticeable. And then, when they get to about two, two and a half, you can see it's starting to really develop around the neck. Uh, once they get to about four years old, you, they have that sort of mo mohawk look, three and a half, four years old. They have that mohawk, mo little like that's I'm not going to try to say that again and then eventually it starts to spread all around over their neck on their shoulders and down towards their elbows and and that's typically at about five and a half six years old and um, uh, yeah so that that's the way when it's mature but these boys barely have a mane at all and unfortunately that's due to to the mange so until their mane kind of heals up I think they're going to be maneless or it's just going to be um, it's going to be quite deceiving at trying to guess how old they are because these boys aren't particularly old I don't think they're much older or younger than the Inkahuma male so between two and two and a half years old somewhere around there there we go so they're still very, very young boys to have been sent off on their own, and they've been living this way for quite some time. So the fact that they've, you know, even made it to this age is very impressive. Oh, perfect. My favorite position to see lions in, the squatting, squatting lion. Squatting lion, sleeping leopard. Oh, let's go to Tristan. Now, how cool is this? There is Hosanna, and right above him is a giraffe. So <laughs> they're having a little kind of stare off at the moment. It's both spotted animals and <laughs> kind of right. You can't hunt that, no, boy. That is not a meal, I'm afraid. It's not for you. That is too big a giraffe for you to be messing about with. So you may not go after that. Yes, come this side. Up onto the dam wall is where you need to go. So I actually just want to reverse quickly, David, because I want to reposition us slightly because he's going to go onto the dam wall in the most epic spot. So I want to just quickly get us into a nice spot for that because I know where he's kind of heading and I've had him here before. I, rem I don't know if any of you remember that we had a beautiful sighting of him kind of on this dam wall a few weeks ago. And so if we just get into this position here, he should theoretically come straight through and then up onto the top of the dam wall. And I'm hoping he's just going to flop down on the dam wall itself and we'll get a nice kind of low level view of Hosanna. No, don't go that way, Hosanna. Now you're coming the wrong way, boy. Let me get out of his way. So he's going to hopefully just kind of come past us in his normal sort of fashion that he does. He might go for a drink first before coming up onto the dam wall itself. I think he is going to do that. I think he's going to go for a drink first. Are you going to walk straight at us? Hosanna, I moved out the way for you and now you're going to walk this side. He is another story, this cat. 
like I say, we move out the way for him and then he decides, no, it's better for him to be able to kind of be behind us rather than in front of us. So he's just going to sit here for a little bit and then I'm pretty sure he's going to drop over and go and have a little bit of a drink. That's what I'm pretty kind of certain he's going to head and do. And then from there, it'll be interesting as to where he goes. First, I think we're going to go mark a bush. Go investigate. Now, David, I'm going to turn around quickly while we've got a chance and while he's giving us a gap to get around. There we go, scent mark. Right, let's see if we can just drop down here because I'm pretty sure he's going to come down towards the water and if we down we might get a nice low angle view of him kind of coming over the dam wall which will be quite nice so let's see if we can get that David are you ready for this this is the shot that David often asked me to get him so we're going to try and see if this works for once we've tried it before and it's been a tricky kind of thing with Osana because he's often moves around in different directions but this is hopefully going to be where he's going to come there we go so he should hopefully kind of move directly towards us that's the idea anyway now let's see is he going to come our way Osana are you going to walk straight over the wall towards us I do hope so. No, he's not quite coming the way I wanted to, but it's still very, very epic, if you ask me. Well, I think so anyway. Very, very cool. Now he's going to go and say hello to another vehicle quickly first before he comes down for a little drink. So you'll see a car. He's just saying hello to Fenuti on the front. <laughs> and then off he goes. You can see there they, here they are. Right, let me turn you around quickly, David, so that you can see what's going on. One nice thing about driving Jigger as opposed to Rusty is I don't have to hear that squeak on the tires when I turn the tires now, which is quite nice. So here we go, David. Hopefully you're going to try and get David a better view of him as he's sitting up on the wall you'll see there is a car there like i said it's just people that are out here to kind of see these things in real life carlo he has gotten so big isn't that cool look at him he's kind of the king of the throne when you look up at him like that it's always very very special so i'm hoping he's going to just kind of wander down towards us and come and have a really nice drink that's this nice beautiful soft afternoon light and so if he goes round like tingana did for us the other day we should get a beautiful view isn't that special Look at that. He's even got his little julep going. Doesn't he just treat us to the most wonderful sightings, this boy, sometimes? And he's probably going to scent mark that tree. He's going to sniff around and just see who else has been kind of in the area and who's been around before Took Dam. So he's going to have a little smell. He's going to check it out. And I wouldn't be surprised from there he then gives a little scent mark and makes himself known. Let's see if he smells him. Fukazi could have also scent marked there. Remember, Fukazi had that kill in this area. Are you going to spray, Hosanna? No, he's still sniffing quite intensely. Let's see how it goes. He's still kind of looking around. No, there he goes. Tom, he is a regal prince indeed. Now, he's not doesn't look like he's going to go drink. He looks like he's actually walking away from the water a little bit. So he's kind of just skirting the edge of the dam. But look at that light. Oof. It is seriously beautiful. Orange light on a golden coat is as good as it gets, that's for sure. So you know, he's just stopping and watching now and having a little look around. There he goes off his kind of moving. I wonder if he's just going to go round and then eventually kind of come down and have a little drink. We're just going to let some of the other vehicles kind of position themselves. They've got guests and obviously, you know, we get so spoiled with spending so much time that you sometimes got to just let the guests have a little bit of a chance and let them kind of see what's going on for a while. So we'll wait and see if he does come down towards the water. And while we wait, let's send you back across, I think, to the lines, but I don't know which ones because both Taylor and Steve have them. We have just got our sleepy cats who are still rolling around, not really doing too much. Starting to get a bit chilly now, almost ready to put on a jersey. And we haven't got our elephants that come through and disturb 
the lion so I think that they'd probably be just going to rest on up and just take it easy now this male over here the one that's got the most mange he's got lots of scratches on him so I don't know if he's been on a squabble recently it could have been with one of the Nkuma lionesses it could have been with his coalition member it could have been with the evoker males but he did have it when he was looking towards us just a minute ago he did have a couple of scratches on his face but that could have also been off uh, now recently um, as in when I say recently like early this morning when they were feasting on the warthog carcass you know, it's quite easy that the two of them would have been scrapping over it's not a particularly massive meal for the two of them they devoured whether they killed it themselves or a leopard killed it we'll never know um, but whatever was left of it they devoured, devoured it all in one go so so that could have happened too you know, that typically does happen amongst prize lions there's a lot of swatting a lot of growling there's no table manners and a brave turtle dove <laughs> it was funny to watch that turtle dove go past. Uh, Lanon, you know, if we get good rain, it could actually help with their mange. So, it, like I said, with, with with all the rain brings new grass, new leaves, just new life. It might also help with, you know, bathing them essentially. Obviously, lions don't go playing around in the water very often. There are some prize lions that do prefer water, like the lions in the delta, I think, don't have a choice in Botswana they're surrounded by water all the time and then even the lions in Botswana and in Zambia along the Zambezi River often cross the rivers and um, to go from you know a, well opposite side to opposite side whether they have to go through passport control I'm not too certain but um uh, so yeah so the mange could definitely be helped with a, bit, with a bit of rain but then again the quality of food will just improve for the herbivores so that means that then when they eat a buffalo or an impala that they're going to have all the nutrients that they need because remember, lions and leopards and things like that, they can't eat grass. They can't get the proteins, the carbohydrates and the phosphorus and other, you know, nutrients and vitamins and things like that that are all within the plant species. So the, the prey species, the herbivores, turn it into something that they can feed on. And if those herbivores are lacking those nutrients, then the lions most certainly will lack them too. Ah. But they have got their heads up. But there's some ox pickers that have come down. You might be able to hear them. And they're just on the on that log this could be quite cool to watch they're shouting at the lions they're unimpressed they've gone predator predator lion lion there's a lion there's a lion has everyone seen the lion i think is exactly what they're saying right now look how unimpressed he is he's gone oh mm -hmm. Oh, the ox peckers. But he's got beautiful eyes, though. Mm -hmm. He really does have piercing golden eyes. And unfortunately, he's lost most of the hair around his face, which is quite a nice contrast. But don't worry. These, these things are strong. That's a, those are all the things that you're seeing there. Those are the nest cams. And we're not using them at the, at the moment, but they are still just there. So that doesn't seem to bother the red-billed ox pecker too much. <laughs> Emma says she couldn't see the nest cam, it's so well camouflaged. Ha 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 so funny. Camo jokes, the best kind. Everybody loves that. My favourite is when somebody wearing full camo comes up to me and greets me and I'm like, who's there? <laughs> That's my best thing to do. <laughs> Just pretend that they, I can't see them. Yeah, I don't know. Sometimes I'm funny, but most of the time not really. I actually live, I actually go into Joburg and I go to all the outdoor shops walking around just so that I can say that line to people. <laughs> or to farm, not quite the four ways farmers market, you don't really see anybody wearing camo there. Go to the free state, I don't know, I think we'll see lots of people wearing camo. <laughs> ah, Hosanna seems to be stealing the show this afternoon, so why not go back to him? Well, he's still moving, and I think he's heading to where Tingana abandoned that kill, and I think there's still food, or bits of meat, in that tree. It looks like it's still hanging there, so I wonder if that's where he's on his way to now. There's that carcass that was up in that tree for quite a while, so he might be heading straight towards that old carcass. Now, that meat must be completely dry by now, but you never know with Hassan. He's heading straight there at the moment. The tree is the one that is just behind this green tree in front of me, is where that carcass is dangling, and so I'm pretty sure that's where he's off to he's got his nose to the air are you going to sit there and pose beautifully for us Osana? 
But isn't that wonderful? I think that's wonderful. It's very special when he poses like that. And now he's going to even get his paw up so that he can look around and just kind of... He is very much a performer, that's for sure. He likes to kind of show off as much as possible, does this boy. And, well, we're not going to complain, are we? Quite surprised which way he's kind of moving. Sorry, David. Um, surprised he hasn't gone for water first, but I think he wants to go check out this carcass. Look, you see, he's got his nose to the air and he's just sniffing a little bit. And the carcass is just round this bend, so that's where the tree is that's got that old, old piece of meat in it. It's almost, what, five, six days old now since that carcass was abandoned. So I'm pretty sure, you see, now he's smelling exactly where it was dragged. The old drag mark ran right there. And he's looking now in towards that tree, and there should be a little piece of that meat still in that tree around the corner. Let's just double check. Yes, it's definitely still in there. So there is a little bit of meat still in the tree, but it, it, I mean, it must be seriously dry now. So if you look up and to the left from him, that's where it is, and he's walking straight towards it. There you can see the bit of the carcass in the sort of left middle part of the tree itself. And a little bit left there, David, and up a bit. There we go, and there it is. That's the rest of that carcass that Tingana abandoned that's sitting right up in the top there. So I wonder if he's going to just jump up there and have a little try and sniff around and see if that's anything that he can eat. I mean, there is ultimately still legs and a bit of bone that he can crunch down and get some nutrients from, so I'm pretty sure he's going to jump up into that area. He's kind of sniffing about. Probably fine that he'll eat for a little bit, and then once he's done that, he's going to come down and maybe come for a drink. But you see how he's sniffing around and kind of looking and listening and just making sure there's no other leopard that's still here. Callan, yes, just like his dad, ever the opportunist and always kind of looking out for a free meal. So, like I say, he's going to eventually see it and go up the trees, just making sure nobody else is here first, especially because there's a bit of a bank, so he can't see what's on the other side. So he's smelling, sniffing, he'll be smelling Mfakazi, he'll be smelling Tingana. And so those things will kind of make him a little bit kind of wary as to what he's doing. But he will definitely pop up into the tree as he goes. There's, like I say, a bit of kill up in the tree itself. So... He will head in that direction for sure. Come on, Hosanna. It's obviously smelling something there now. He's picked up the scent. But unfortunately, it's not the nicest tree that he's going to go up if he does get to that little meal up there. It's not exactly very pleasant. What have you smelt, Hosanna? So Arnold, who is a new viewer, welcome Arnold to Safari Live. I'm glad that you think that this is very, very epic. Arnold, we are in the Greater Kruger National Park in the northeastern corner of South Africa. It is an epic, epic ecosystem and we're in a part of that Greater Kruger National Park called the Sabi Sands, which is famous for its leopards. Um, and so it's one of the, the kind of best things about being in these areas is that there are a lot of relaxed leopards like this. Now what's interesting there is that Hosanna has sniffed and now look he's scent marking. So he's scent marking over who else whoever else has urinated there. So if it was Mfakazi or if it was Tingana that urinated there, he's just gone and laid a bit of a chemical scent straight over the top as if to say this is mine not anybody else's and I'm pretty sure like I say he will go up into the tree even if he doesn't eat it he'll go and investigate it it is old it is dry and it is in no way any good to probably eat but a leopard is a animal that will scavenge regularly and so there might still be a bit of nutrients left in that particular tree for him you can just see he's kind of just sniffing around at the base I'm pretty sure his organ of Jacobson is working overtime as he tries to figure out who exactly has been here. There will also be a lot of scent for hyenas, so a lot of the Juma clan was here at one point, there was three members that were here, now look he's going to go straight up, I'm pretty sure he's looking now at that carcass, no he's decided that's not, maybe he's decided it's not fresh enough and the, the smell of another leopard is far more intriguing than the actual carcass in, itself and no there we go, he's going to go up, there we go, so the carcass is there, there we go. All right, let's try and reposition ourselves a little bit so we can get a bit closer to where he actually is.
Right, now while we get closer and figure out where exactly we're going to park, let's send you back across to Steve, who, no, apparently not. Steve has lost reception, so we're not going to be sending you to Steve. You're going to stay with us and Hosanna. I'm just going to try and kind of get out the way a little bit and allow the tourism vehicles to be in a good space. There we go. Hosanna, that is, it's, oh, you can even hear how hard it is with his claws. Can you hear that? It's like dry, dry meat. I know there's another vehicle driving. But you can even see it. It's, it's, it's stiff. It's so dry. Let's have a look. I don't think he's going to eat this. Yes, Conrad, that is indeed biltong of the finest order. In fact, no, it's not the finest biltong. It is far too dry for even that. It doesn't even smell that bad being here. I don't think he's going to eat this. Listen. hear how dry it is it almost sounds like a cardboard box more than a piece of meat and Hosanna that can't be nice boy he doesn't he's not convinced is he kind of sniffing it but where you had to find this a few days ago then you would have been happier he's got a leg now a leg will be better I think because at least that bone he can crush down and Kind of eat? No, that's not even good. Painted Wolf, yes, it was a punching bag. It's a pretty interesting kind of punching bag to have. And he's not convinced, is he? He's kind of bites it, then he's like, this is not what I ex kind of expected. No, and then down he comes. He's had enough, I think. He doesn't want that kill. He's decided it's old, it's not for him. He is a leopard of discerning taste. He likes fresh meat. Oh, that branch might break. Yeah, no, he did all right. He got down fine. Hosanna, you are another cat altogether. Go have some water now. It's a beautiful light for you to go and drink some water. Look how disappointed he looks. <laughs> right, now while we kind of see what he's going to do next, because he is a clown, let's send you back across to the sleepy lions with Taylor. I cannot believe Hosanna doesn't like Biltong. I mean, how ungrateful. He could have nibbled away and chewed on that. Tristan would have been able to have shown him how to actually eat Biltong. And maybe these lions would perhaps enjoy a little taste of Biltong. But right now, they're enjoying a slumber. So I don't think that they'll be worried about eating right now. I would love to know how well these boys can actually hunt. Shame, I mean, they don't really have anyone to do the hard work and I don't think they've really had anybody to learn from so they've really been thrown into the deep end so this is again they're fighters they're survivors the fact that they've been on their own for such a long time and not living in a pride is pretty spectacular so I really feel like something like mange is is not a big deal for these boys I feel like they've been through a whole lot worse so I'm looking forward to see and following their story and I hope that they do stick around on Jumo, at least areas that we can traverse and I hope that they make a full recovery. And who knows, maybe it'll be a success story where the a young male from the Inkuhuma Pride and the Talamati male plus these two Mungen boys move on out. But there are some Impala walking quite far into the distance, the last of the light as most of, uh, most of where we are, we're in the shadows now. We're not in the pride lands anymore, but the Impala are, and we're kind of gazing out uh, towards them. And they might be coming down here to have a little drink a little bit later, but the wind is swirling quite a bit, so they could pick up on the sense of the line, and then they're not going to be too impressed, and then they won't want to come and have a drink down here. Now, whether these lions would hunt these Impala, I, I highly doubt it, and the reason why I say that is because it is so open and exposed here. There's virtually nowhere that the lions could hide behind if they were to try and pounce on their prey, unless they were to lay in the bushes elsewhere, let them come and have a drink, and perhaps go after them once they've moved away from the pan. And that would kind of be their only option. 
Hmm. Good. Nice. We're very lucky how we all started off with no cats this afternoon, and now in the last hour of drive, we just got cats everywhere. Steve's got one walking towards him. Well, this lioness has snuck up. We got all the way around, and you can probably hear the wildebeest screaming their displeasure. We couldn't even see her, and then she made a dart and missed, and they all turned around and just have a listen. That is thousands of wildebeests shouting. Oh, some lions about to call. Wonder if you can hear that off to our left hand side. Lion's not very loud at the moment. It's coming from the other side of the lugger there where we left the rest of the pride still feeding on that wildebeest. Sound like bullfrogs, these wildebeest. It's really strange. So the sun is set in the Masai Mara, the Mara Triangle. And uh, we are using the infrared light at the moment to be able to see what's going on. And that lioness has disappeared. The sun sets a little bit earlier up here than it does in South Africa at this time of year. And uh, yeah, here we are. And in the darkness, we've managed to finally get all the roofs up and away. Uh, we came all the way around and uh, we couldn't find this one lioness close up to the herd. There are more of them were coming up from behind, but we thought there was no chance. The next thing, she exploded. The grass is very short over here, so you wouldn't have expected it to have gotten so close. But um, maybe we can get up there and see if we can get another view. The wildebeest have all moved off. They do, Lynn. They sound like frogs as well. Almost doubts myself for a second there, but they weren't making a lot of noise until she chased them. And then everywhere here in front of us and all the way down the valley, all the gnus started shouting their displeasure. <laughs> <laughs> First time I've experienced that now with them all shouting. But um, I think there are more lioness on the way forward. They spread out along this open area. Not really giving too much assistance to the one lioness we had in front yet. And she's gone back into the herd there. They all still shout at her. Maybe she's going to try and chase them back towards this area where her sisters are lying up. But um, very difficult to see anything in this landscape at the moment. The light, as you know, is gone. And using the infrared can only cover so much distance. Somewhere lurking in those thickets or in that long grass is some lions. Okay, well, we're going to move up a little bit and see if we can get her again. See what she's up to up ahead. But seeing as we are losing our lions in the darkness, Taylor has put a light on her lions. We, whew, sorry, we've got mm, the wonderful scent of off Brussels sprouts at the moment. That's what we're kind of smelling. It's quite gross, it's really not pleasant at all. Anyways, our lions who are just coming to have a drink again. Yay, action. This is epic. At least they're doing something now other than just sleeping. So that's good news for us. They must be very, very thirsty. Just kind of lapping away at a whole lot of that water. Unfortunately, I don't think we're gonna get the greatest of reflections. Do you wanna try, Seb? We can. Let me go around to the other side of the dam. Don't be scared, I'm starting the car. And of course it must squeak and make the most unnecessary sounds. Mm, a little one. Not much, we might end up inside the pan. But there is a little bit of a reflection in the last of the light. It's not particularly great, but it will do, hey Seb? Something different. The wind is starting to pick up now as well. So 
So if we can turn this radio down a little bit. Barnett, uh, lines, I don't think lines particularly have much of a smell. What do you think, Seb, other than, than this? Yeah, the fart and the poop, the f but not them sad. <laughs> there we go, you heard it straight from Seb. Other than their farts and their poop, <laughs> Seb's words there, they, uh, they re I don't think they particularly smell like much. When they're wet, yes, and they smell like damp dogs. These guys at the moment smell like rotting carcass. Or like there's something wrong with their insides, but that's also because they've eaten an entire warthog, so that's to be expected. But they don't smell particularly nice. But otherwise, I don't think they have a scent. Wildebeest, I cannot stand the smell of a wildebeest. Oh, it's vile. And I don't really like the smell of wild dogs either. That's a very, very pungent, sweet smell. Sweet socks, or well, sweet old socks with cheese in them. Is kind of the smell that I think you get. And you can hear the impala actually just have a little listen. Some of them have started snorting. Of course, they've all stopped snorting now. But they were making the popcorn sound. And uh, that's because I think some of them from across the other side have actually spotted the lions now that they're, you know, up and moving around, not really concealing themselves much, which is to be expected. I'm surprised you can actually hear the lapping. No, oh, you should be able to hear. If you're watching the dam cam, you'll definitely be able to hear the impala snorting. The rest of the herd is not convinced just yet, but there's one or two that have actually seen what's going on. You'll see every time the impala snorts, it kind of gets the attention of this youngster. Yes, I don't think these cats have to worry too much about finding water. They'll be all right. They seem to be doing a good job already. A couple of turtle doves passing by. Yes, Tony, this is actually a pump pan here at Voyatella. So if the water does get too low, they just keep topping it up. And with all the animals around at the moment, I think they pump it regularly. I'm not sure how often they're putting water into it. But most days it seems to be quite full. So they're using borehole water, which is how the camp obviously gets its water too. And they'll all be linked. So the two pans right near camp. This one's in front of Vuyatela camp and the other one is in front of Galago. And there's little, just very little concrete sort of pans that get filled with water. This lion is drinking a whole lot, hey? Super thirsty. I might have to take an illegal photo because it's very cool. And I really like the look of this lion's eyes. I want him to look straight towards me. Look into my eyes, lion, so I can take a picture. Ah, oh, well, it seems as though Hosan has stopped bouncing around from point A to B. He's finally taking a rest. Yes, he's stopped bouncing around for now. It's been very interesting watching him as he's gone about his business here because he's basically moved um, around this carcass and he's followed a scent along which was not where Tingana walked and he scent marked all the way along then he turned and he's come and he lay exactly where Tingana laid the other morning when we had him leaving this kill so he's following the exact same route Tingana walked and scent marking over the top of all of it so I don't know if it's maybe dad's scent that's triggering him to try and be like this or if it's potentially you know just him smelling any leopard and going kind of crazy because he smelt another one but he's definitely following the exact same route that his dad kind of used and and was walking so it's going to be interesting if he turns back towards the dam now following that scent or if he's just going to kind of continue through this little thicket and continue towards the sort of eastern side of the reserve i'm not sure but we'll soon find out that is for certain amazing their sense of smell though i mean it's you know almost a week since a leopard defic i mean urinated in this area and yet he's still able to pick it up and still able to glean information from that which is really is what amazes me so you know very 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 cool to kind of see 
This is Anna. If Tingi boxes him, he's going to have a bit of a problem because Tingi is still much bigger than what he is. Even though he has grown in leaps and bounds and he's gotten bigger, he still isn't as big as Tingana yet, I'm afraid. I wonder if it's not better just to go onto the other side and catch him on the other side. I think that's what we're going to do. We're not going to bash through all of here. There's going to be two vehicles that are going to follow him. We're just going to go around and get him from the other side. Hopefully, it looks like he's heading straight towards the other road on the other side. So that should help us be able to kind of get to where he is going. Let's try and see. Yes, he is walking pretty much towards the other road. So let's rather just get around that side instead of crashing through. What a beautiful evening though. The sun is just starting to set now over Bifuzuk Dam wall. It's kind of just in the distance here. Um, Hosanna milling about, giraffe that were around. Perfect way to end one's day, I would say. Sorry, David, I'm bouncing you all over the place. Jigger is definitely not as comfortable as Rusty, nor as powerful, I'm afraid. Jigger is far more feeble than what Rusty is. Rusty's got lots of grunts, and even Wendy to a degree, but Jigger, I'm afraid, is just a bit gutless sometimes when it comes to trying to get out of drainage lines and the likes. I suppose she is the oldest and so I'm not surprised that she's a little tired and a little bit kind of weary of work that she's done. She's driven around here quite some time. Uh, Hosanna should come out pretty much where I am now so I'm just trying to see where the cars are in relation to us. There he is. So. Janika, you say you haven't watched in a week. Why not, Janika? What's going on? Why haven't you watched in a week? I'm very, very disappointed. No, I'm just joking. I understand. Life gets in the way. And uh, yes, he has grown. He, He's kind of developing and bulking up as the days go on. Now, he's straight through here. I can't see him now, David, but he's walking. Yes, there, I can see him now. So he's walking from left to right almost. Can you see him there, Dave? Straight through. Yeah. He's just kind of sniffing around, investigating. Should pop out kind of towards where we are. So he just came right round, which made it a lot easier than just walking through the bushes. And come on, Hosanna, this way. Seems like he's going to come generally in our direction, which is quite nice. There's a lot of thickets between us and him, so he's going to have to do some loops and little figure of eights to try and sneak through. There he goes. He is looking good though, isn't he? He looks really, really healthy these days. And I mean, lots of walking, if you think about it, he was, two days ago, was on Little Gowrie and kind of moved around quite a bit in the past couple of days and definitely done a lot of marking as he's gone. There we go, look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Hello, boy. What are you looking at? I'm just walking along. I know this is selfish, but I really hope we are there to hear his first saw and to actually hear him sawing for the first time. It would really make my day if we were. I know it would be dangerous for him, but it would make my day if he did saw in front of us for the very first time. And I wonder what he's going to sound like, if it's going to be a little soft roar to start with, or saw, should I say, and if then it's going to get a lot kind of deeper as he goes. I'm just going to go forward a little bit because we're going to go past the thicket and then he's going to come onto the road pretty much where I'm going to head. So, no drink for you, Hosanna. I'm intrigued by that. Right, now it sounds like, as with the Mara, typically there's a fair number of lines, but it sounds like Steve is having a bumper evening and has found yet another one. Well, we managed to get back around. Uh, we followed that lioness that chased the herd. Now they scattered in all different directions. She's now crossed the road and is lying up waiting for them to calm down a bit. She's staring at them. You can hear them off to our left. They're not far away. They know something's up. They're not quite sure what though. She's still seemingly on her own. We don't know what happened to the rest of the lioness that were with her. At one stage there were five. We came all the way around originally and um, they all just disappeared in the long grass. It's unfortunately what happens at this time of year without the ability to off-road can't really keep up with them and when they want to disappear well that is what the tawny cat does but 
thankfully we turned around and we managed to find her again she's just on a little bit of a slope tucked into the long grass there and um, see how far away the herds are from there just down the slope here to our left you can't really see them is that an eye or is that a <laughs> I think that might be a, a vehicle in the distance or something a star well, it's definitely not an eye so there's a herd of wildebeest just off to the left here down in the bottom of the valley here but it's, it's dark there's no stars it's overcast this, even James won't be able to find her very easily again there she is with the infrared light it helps us to find them but look how well she blends in that is exactly the objective but it just amazes me two wildebeest down in the well the pride is still hunting it's just that nature of the cat and they can't help themselves oh time for a nap a little bit of a blink Well, as soon as there's any action, you will come right back to us. But in the meantime, the little chief is going to do a walk by. Well, there goes the little chief. He's just moving past us. Hello, boy. We were just talking about how epic this cat is and how fortunate we are to spend so much time with him and how, you know, it's it's a pretty special thing to have a cat of this kind of relaxed nature and you know, especially even for the lodges like Juma that have guests that come and you know he must be one of the most seen leopards in the Sabi sands at the moment he's found almost daily um, and and with regular ease and you know he's he's really is a show in, uh, in many respects as well so we're super fortunate that we get to spend as much time with him as we do um, he really really is a special cat now we are going to see him disappear around the corner and the other cars are going to come past us so you will see a car shortly so you're going to have to see my mug unfortunately rather than the beautiful leopard instead you're going to have to look at me for a little bit no, I'm just joking we'll let these guys come past I'm just going to roll backwards so that they can all come past and so while I let everybody come past me and let them kind of get in front let's send you back across to Taylor and the lions We are still here. We haven't moved. I thought we've invested all this time into it. We might as well just stick it out. And they're just rolling around every now and then. And Seb and I both look, well, popped our heads up and we both looked north. And so did this um, the Mangani boy that we're looking at now. And we think we heard a lion. Whether it was a contact call that was closer than we think or a lion roaring in the very far distance, it was quite difficult to um, to kind of tell exactly what it was. So. Let's see if we, well, we're gonna, we'll sit and wait and hopefully it happens again. Well, that's the idea behind it anyways. So I don't know if the evoker males are gonna come back, if it's the Inkahumas or who. Yes, the action would be great. Wouldn't it just? There we go, just big stretches, rolling around. Maybe they're gonna get up there. You can start to see the mane on his chest. But very, very underdeveloped for his age, unfortunately. But he'll just have to do. That's just one of those things, I suppose. Eh? They'll be all right, though. There's no need to worry about them. I think I really think if they just pay a bit more attention and grooming themselves, it will improve immensely. But they don't really seem to be bothered with cleaning themselves up. And the short time I've spent with them, I haven't seen them grooming once. Not even one another. Not, not that I. And you think, actually, you'd think with the two of them just living on their own, they'd be fairly affectionate and such a young age. But I have not seen that at all. I mean, they must be affectionate somehow because that's how the mange is spread. You can see how it takes over around the head and around the neck where they'll typically greet one another. So those are normally the first places. And you can see where he can, likes to rub his belly too. Have a look. So you can see it's not scabbing too badly. So it's kind of just the hair that's sort of missing there. But you can see that it, and some of it looks like it's a little bit growing back. Maybe it's growing back, who knows? We haven't really spent much time with these boys, so we don't know. But I think it's going to be important that you all keep screenshots, though, 
and over the next couple of months if we're still seeing them just keep comparing and you'll be able to tell if they're improving or not but i do think once rainy season comes around it will definitely definitely improve fast asleep again and it's just unfortunate they can't really reach around their ears and the tops of their heads Poofy Poof, I love that name. Thank you for making me say that out loud. Um, yes, I suppose they are in fact slightly more susceptible to sunburn because they don't have the hair protecting it. But if you've noticed, the skin is quite dark. So they've got quite a bit, bit of um, uh, melanin in their skin. So that will naturally be a defense against the sun. Um, you know, the problem comes in when you have that sort of light pigmentation that can become burned quite badly. But, uh, but nonetheless, y you're quite right. Um, with that skin being exposed, they're definitely going to be more susceptible and to it. And I think that's probably one of the reasons as well. Imagine getting severely sunburned, because even anybody with darker skin, even with olive skin, yes, you would maybe not as, um, as susceptible to being burned to say someone like me who's got fairly, well, I've actually got quite fair skin. Um, I've got to put, I've got a lather up on the sunscreen, but you can, you can still, of course, burn. Uh, maybe that a lot of the scabbing also comes from that. Can you imagine? Fast oh, asleep, boys. I'm glad they're resting. I'm glad they've had a drink of water. They've had a meal to eat. Their day couldn't have gone any better. And Steve's is still going fairly well, too. Well, yes, Taylor, thanks. This lioness has now gone and walked straight behind us. She came from the front. We're going to have to try to turn around. I think she is making a move on these wildebeest. I just have to double check where she is before I turn around. It's very, very wet. Yeah, you know, you've got to be careful how you turn around on this road. Oh, here comes the rain again. Can't go off into this little depression. You go off. And it's over, so it's good like a, a nine point turn. This is going to be awkward. I'm sorry, you have to watch me do this. <laughs> but on the side of the road here, we nearly slipped into it earlier, and well, Marshmallow Club was nearly part and parcel. So, terribly sorry about this driving. Just got to make sure we don't slip down into the drainage. Everyone's watching me very closely. I'm sweating now under my jacket. Brent is ho he's watching, going, come on, Steve Ovo. You're going to fall into it. Don't do it. Yes, I made it. One more. There she is in front of us now. Phew. That was hard work with one arm. There she goes. I'm just going to get up behind her here. She's sneaking in onto the left. There's more wildebeest over there. As the rain comes down again, she's just off the left here. There we go. James just off to the left. Sammy Jane, it is indeed the wild. If you had any doubt, there she is. Using the IO light, I was trying my best not to put any of our spotlight on because with this infrared light, the animals can't see her. We're doing no sort of disservice to either the predator or the prey. There we go. There's the scent marking again. After rainfall, it's very common for for territorial animals to, if they do scent mark, to scent mark again. The rain washes it away. And it's important to maintain those boundaries. She's moving very quietly, trying to figure out where the herd has gone. I can hear them all off to the right-hand side. She's kind of decided, well, they're all a bit too attentive. Let me move back to the ones I chased initially. They might have forgotten about me. He's walking parallel now with the road. wonder if she's going to have a surprise. There were some elephant there, so scent marking again. There was some elephant up there. We t we've already turned around in that spot. It was a nice little road to do so before. It was a lot less awkward than what you just saw me do. 
Who knows if she's hungry? Maybe she's just on a territorial mission, seemingly all on her own. Okay, well, while we keep up with this female, let's quickly go back to Tristan and the little chief. Well, we're still trying to keep up with Hassan. He's still moving. He's changed his route a little bit now. He was heading straight east, and now he's cut southwards. So he's heading towards Hippo Pools, which is where he made his appearance all those weeks ago for the very first time after heading off to Londolozi for a brief kind of jaunt down that way and so you know nice to kind of see him back in this area so a creature of habit is old Hosanna in many respects he does the same things and now kind of turning back tail up in the air just off to our right hand side and just kind of milling about now the thing is is we are going to get some other vehicles that are going to want to come here I mean, we've been here for quite some time and we spent a lot of time with him this morning without anyone around so I can't really stay too much longer I'm afraid which is a bit of a shame I would have liked to have followed him through the night but let's at least admire the fact that we've had an epic epic sighting of him this afternoon we've really been kind of spoiled in that we've got to follow him around and his antics once again so he's really is a very very special cat and like i say we've been super spoiled to spend as much time with him crazy i suppose it's possible if you look at a leopard like him Fakazi, he doesn't seem to have been territorially dominant anywhere for some time maybe for short bursts but it doesn't seem as though he really established himself too much uh, it's possible i don't know i um, mean it goes against their nature and it goes against the way that they do things but it is possible to kind of see it and might actually happen so you never really know um if if these things can happen but i don't think hosan is going to be that you can see he is scent marking now he's doing it the only way that a leopard knows how and that is spraying bushes and scraping his feet so while he kind of ambles off down the road that's going to be the last view we're going to turn off from here and let the other guys come in and allow them to kind of get some time with Hosanna and we'll probably go and just try and see if maybe we can find any sign of those lions that Taylor heard roaring was on the way kind of home is that time to start kind of slowly heading back home but we'll just do some loops and just check maybe turn off somewhere and just listen in case we can hear a roar or contact call like Taylor heard and maybe we get lucky and we actually find the rest of the Nkuma pride but what a special afternoon it's been with these with this cat he really is such a special individual right now i'm going to get out of here allow others to come in and so while i do that let's send you back to steve and his lion luck yeah well we are still with this beautiful lady who is taking it upon herself to demarcate the entire area as she goes characteristic lion fashion so now i have seen a female lioness do the characteristic backward spraying not just the legs scratching and the urinating on the floor she's done it repeatedly as we trying to keep up with her without influencing anything at all as soon as we start moving she decides to almost go off the road and then we stop and then she keeps walking in the road so she's playing a few tricks with us all sorts of noises in the night distant calling of lions wildebeest shouting there's a contact call of lion to the right yeah oh it's her it's her calling have a listen on the light in there for you because she's given away her presence walking down the road calling like that so just to give you the perspective of how she's walking in the road clearly not too bothered by giving away her presence after the scent marking but I don't think she's very hungry just can't help themselves walking around there's wildebeest everywhere food aplenty try to get back up again see if we can get some form of identification of her Definitely the Olalola pride. Officially, you 
crazy legs. You love that sound. Yes, indeed. I love it too. It started off quite small. It thought it was coming off from the side. In fact, it was coming from her. So officially, there are four adult lioness in this pride with nine sub-adult males and uh, four sub-adult females. So one of the females we saw earlier clearly looked like an adult to me at the time, but it was quite tricky with, um, with the light and with them being shoulder deep in a wildebeer's carcass as well. Here we go, she's just off on the side. She's probably going to carry along on the road here for some time. Maybe her calls will attract the rest of her pride to get up and start moving. And this is probably what we've been seeing through the landscape. All these vultures accumulating on carcasses in the morning as the lions are killing two or three sort of wildebeest at night. Not really finishing them, just kind of getting bored and, and moving on. Their constant movements. She's clearly bored. Maybe she's deciding she wants to walk, work, <laughs> walk off her dinner. There she goes. And I love keeping to the roads. It's much easier to walk, much faster. A little bit, a little bit quieter as well. And often, as we've seen, these animals like to demarcate their territories along pretty much well-trodden pathways, which would invariably have been rhino hippo paths, elephant paths. But now, our roads made by by us for the vehicles. So we see if we can keep up with it. But in the meantime, it seems like Taylor has got the scavenging bird, but in the night. We do, we're just pretty much putting the last piece of the puzzle um, into the puzzle piece, I suppose. But uh, there are the vultures sitting up in a tree and that's basically, you hear the Egyptian geese flying over. That's basically where the warthog was uh, that the Mangan boys were feeding on this morning. We briefly had a sighting with them. I don't know how much they would have actually got from that carcass. I think the boys probably would have finished most of it off. Maybe there's just scraps around the head, perhaps a bits and pieces in between the rib bones. But other than that, I think that those vultures would have been disappointed that they weren't really left with anything. Right. Tristan said to me the other day, after I made the mistake of challenging him to an owl challenge, that this is in fact the place to be for owls. Shall we test it out and see if we can find any? Or maybe it's just Tristan. He says Wahlberg's Road is littered with owls. So we shall look now. I'm going to look for the silhouetted birds in the trees. It's quite nice with there not being lots of leaves around. It does make spotting birds a lot easier. I haven't seen, have you seen an owl yet, Seb? I haven't either, and Tristan goes on about how he sees so many. He sees so many, every time I come down here, there's just hundreds. So he goes on. <laughs> I'm joking, he doesn't say it like that. I don't know if that's an owl. Hang on, let me just quickly check. No, it's not an owl. I thought I saw something, but it wasn't. It's a branch. Stichosaurus. Okay. And Tristan has already found a pearl spotted owl today. I mean, that's just really bruising my ego a whole lot. Thanks, Tristan. I'm just joking. <laughs> ah, I'm excited. Tristan and I having, and Ali are having dinner tonight. Tristan's making. He says, oh, he said to me the other night, he says, what are we going to have for dinner? Because Ali was like, let's just have McDonald's. And I listen, I was game for it, except she was coming from so far away. I was like, ah, three hour old McDonald's. That's never nice. And <laughs> so, we were just, you know, thinking about our cravings and then I said, I really wanted pasta. I haven't had a good pasta in a while. And we were umming and ahhing and Tristan doesn't like mushrooms, which is a nuisance. So we can't have mushrooms. We must ask him what he says about mushrooms. Then... Oh, obviously Ali is now sitting in final control and she's sassing. Anyway, she says that I mustn't lie and that I wanted McDonald's. I did, but I don't like three hour old McDonald's. I couldn't think of anything worse. Ew. Anyway, so I didn't get that, but I'm sure Ali, Ali got good old Mackie D's. Anyways, so Tristan then says last night, he goes, I'll make a mean chicken. He goes, I'll make a mean prawn curry. So I was like, cool, sweet. For those of you, prawns are like shrimps, but not really the prawns, because shrimps for us are like these tiny little things in South Africa. And uh, so I was like, okay. So now we're having chicken and prawn pasta. I don't know, Ali, are we still having that? Is that what Tristan you know made you get from the shops because Ali obviously had to um, then go and do a bit of shopping for us today 
She didn't get the chicken. So we're just having prawn pasta then. I'm still excited either way. So I'll I'll Instagram tonight's dinner. How does that sound? It'll be it'll be my last po last posts on the uh, on the Safari Live official Instagram page. If you're not following it, best get on it at Safari Live official. That is how you can follow us on Instagram, and that's where we post all the cool things too. Ah, uh, okay, right. Now Tristan's had some time to prepare. And uh, I'm going to judge him hard like the chefs on Master Chef, so best you be ready, Tristan. Let's go across to him and see if he's ready to get his cook on. Who says that I'm cooking, Taylor? You're the one that's going to be cooking, didn't you know? Taylor thinks that she I'm cooking, but it's actually her that's going to be doing all the work today. Thank you very much for pulling over. Um, but no, we, it should be a nice dinner. It should be it should be a delightful dinner actually. Hopefully we'll get something done that's good. I've made it before and it's pretty tasty, so we'll see how it goes. And apparently Taylor's now going to rate it and Instagram it. I'm not feeling much of the pressure, Taylor. I must be honest. I, I don't really mind if she's to have something than we normally get in camp. So hopefully it will be tasty and, and good and Taylor won't judge me too and give me too much trouble. So to see how it goes. And it should be good fun at least to look something a little different. Right now Taylor's instincts of lions are correct. There's lions calling at Torchwood Camp uh, at the pan in front of and then there's also five females calling from one eyed pan on Simba Mili, but very close to Triple M. Unfortunately, though, no view from Triple M itself, and, and we can't go into Torchwood given that there are other vehicles already there. So it's going to be the end of our lion kind of search for the evening, but at least Taylor was correct. She heard them, and she's not going crazy at all. And hopefully, you know, they'll come back outside at some point. It'd be nice to catch up with the. I wonder what the split is at the moment. If it's if it's three, two, who's where and what's going on? Because if it's five, there, then there's quite a few missing. Right now, it sounds like the Gauri cutline signal is claiming us, so let's send you back across to Taylor. Right, so who's ready? Uh, I'm really excited about tonight's dinner, like, I'm super amped. It's going to be spectacular. So now not only do you get, we play the breakfast game in the morning, but now I'm playing dinner. So we'll see. Ali is also gluten intolerant, so she's going to have some special pasta. Well, Tristan and I'll just eat the other stuff. <laughs> the old normal things. So, uh, oh, I have a spotlight. Let me get that out. So I'm excited to taste what this is all going to taste like. Prawn pasta. If I have food poisoning tomorrow, it's Tristan's fault. I'm just saying. No. Nah. <laughs> I think he's gonna be a good cook so so yeah I don't know what else we're gonna have wonder what uh, apple juices might feature tonight we'll have to see oh you know what I'm actually just gonna stop for a second because it's just it's very pretty this the, my skyline of trees how gorgeous is that the Maruda trees are quite something out here Very pretty. Uh, I'm glad to. Oh, I'm glad that Tristan has worked out where those lions are calling from because I did think I was going bonkers at one point. But if we go to Steve, who's not going bonkers because he's still with his cats. We are still with this lioness, and after her calling, I'm going to call again. She called earlier, you heard her, and then in the distance, coming from the marsh, a pride responded, and uh, she is just... Contact calling somebody. Not quite sure who she's trying to get hold of.
of a vehicle on the way. Well, she called earlier and a whole pride answered her. I don't know who they were. And then she spent some time against the tree scratching and the contact call Teddy I don't think can go very far but I mean the the, the loud call that they do can go up to uh, eight kilometers the proper call that they do I've just got a vehicle that's approaching from behind yeah so the contact call doesn't carry very far but it's an interesting sort of sound um, I wouldn't I couldn't actually tell you how far away but it's generally for quite local sort of use a contact calls not for very long distance that little mm. that you heard but the roar sorry that's the back of my head she likes to move in front of us and she's just in front of us over here Right, sorry about that everybody. It seems as though the gremlins are getting everybody all the time. Right, so we're just still bumbling around. Seb, can I please turn this down just a little baby bit? Yeah. If that's okay, thank you so much. That light is so bright. Okay, are we going to find a horny badger tonight? Probably not. Are we going to see a white-tailed mongoose? Maybe. Or will the elusive pangolin come out? Probably not. I don't think so. I don't know if I'm ever going to see a pangolin in my life ever. Unless I go to the Kalahari. I feel like that's my only chance of, uh, of seeing, of seeing a, a pangolin. But it's okay. I've been lucky. I've seen so many other cool things. I saw a striped polecat, which I thought I was never going to see in my life. So it's like the South African version of a skunk. They're very rare. You don't see them very often. Okay, so I'm still looking for an owl. Have not seen one owl. Tristan obviously attracts them. I think he puts insects and locusts and things onto his jersey or small mice. And that's why <laughs> the owls like him so much and sit up and watch him as he drives around. Maybe he even dangles them up like this and hands them to him, the owl whisperer. But this is a good area to find. Oh, I do have those lights on. They're doing nothing. Well, that's because I pointed them. I have my little side lights on, but they're not pointing in the right direction, and I can't reach over to that side. So they'll just have to stay off. Okay, let's keep searching. Poofy poof. Ah, oh, second time in one day. You got me to say your name out loud. Pretty impressive. <laughs> Sometimes birds alarm at, at humans. Squirrels definitely do. Every now and then you'll drive past and a squirrel will go hee -hee, ge -ge -ge -ge, and then you like look around there's nothing but you and then they disappear. So I suppose and I have had go away birds alarming at me before so they do sometimes. I think it just kind of depends like I show they're not too phased by us. Occasionally they will but most of the time nah they're not bothered by us. Not a little but we're not really you know chasing after them. Well, I suppose we are still predators, so they're just wary. They can fly. I think they've worked out that we can't fly, can't try, uh, climb trees very well, so there's no need to even alarm at us because us trying to catch a bird would be highly unlikely. Oh, it's very quiet up here tonight. Unusual. Normally there's all sorts of things running around. This is, this is bush baby Marula Central. There's normally one or two bush babies that bound from branch to branch, but haven't seen them tonight. We'll just check the middle road. No, that's not an owl. That's a log. No. From Hong Kong, goodness, I haven't heard from you in ages. For you, I will try and find a bush baby. But like I said, everything is very quiet tonight. I don't know what's happened to all the animals. It's been such a nice day too. It's not like it's freezing cold. I, I, I have this big jacket on because it's the only one I brought. So. I don't know why we're not seeing anything. Come out, come out, animals, come out, please. Tristan and Ali are also going to have to provide me with much entertainment tonight, otherwise I'm going to fall asleep at the dinner table. That will happen. So, I wonder what they're going to do for entertainment. <laughs> right, we'll try this again and send you back to the triangle and hopefully the gremlins won't get Steve.
Well, folks, have a look. It's not very clear. She's just moved off into the block, but she is currently stalking. There is an enormous herd of wildebeest. If you were with me in the beginning of the show, you remember that herd? There she is, kind of top middle. You can see that eye shining. If you were with me in the beginning of the show, you remember that herd of wildebeest that were playing around after you saw the buffalo? Well, we're back at that spot. And, well, when you have a quick shine with the light across, you see thousands of wildebeest. You can see a couple eyes in the top left. She is stalking. She's moving left there, James. Left, James. There she's top left. There she is, middle of the screen now. Not very clear, folks. I do apologize. Okay, well, I'm sorry, folks. You can't actually see what's going on, but she is making her way directly towards a herd. I can just see that eye. The herd, they're all lying up in the open here. I know you probably can't see very clearly. You can see those eyes now, I'm sure. This is when it would be great if we had that FLIR camera. You can see all the wildebeest eyes at the back there. There's thousands of them. Okay, well, while we try and get a better visual of this hunt that's going on, let's go back down to Taylor McCurdy on an owl search. We will be sitting in silence and listening to the bush, 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 couldn't say that right, and watching the scenery. That's what we will be doing for the next 30 seconds to a minute. Beautiful. We unfortunately have nothing else to show you, I'm afraid. <laughs> I've, I've run out of things to talk about. There are no more questions coming in. <laughs> so I thought we might as well just, well, do what I'd probably do in a quiet moment if I was with guests, is just sit and enjoy the bush and, and look at the horizon. Frame very nicely with this apple leaf tree as well, that are in full bloom at the moment. Right. It seems as everyone's given up on the Mara. Off you go to Tristan, who has managed to locate some buffalo. Well, we were on our way kind of slowly back towards home, and we bumped into a few beefy buffaloes that are at the water hole. And I thought, I wonder where maybe these lions went off to, because they would not be wanting to tangle with these guys in their state. I'd imagine they'd be a little bit kind of nervous to be anywhere near big buffalo bulls like this. And buffaloes have just nothing to worry about from those lions. They really are in no way capable of bringing them down, particularly three big bulls like this. They're going to be a force to be reckoned with and in all likelihoods would push those lions far, far, far from this area. And I wonder if that's maybe why they're kind of a little bit sort of defensive in their posture. You see all of them are kind of facing outwards. None of them are actually drinking at the moment. They're all just checking around. And like I say, I have no idea where those lions went. I'm not, I'm not sure where Taylor left them. But I'm pretty sure that they made a hasty retreat when the buffalo arrived. Right, now, while we kind of figure out maybe where these lines went, we'll decide what we're going to do from here. I believe Steve's lines are still on the move, so let's head back to him. Well, thanks, folks. Sorry about that. The the light is very difficult with this infrared to pick up a distance when the lion moves off but she charged into a herd of wildebeest and well they all saw her coming she didn't have quite have the patience or stealth and uh, we've lost her now completely she's in there somewhere wildebeest and zebra have all torn off in the other direction and somewhere lying up in there we don't know i think she lay down after that charge but uh, i just saw her very briefly sprinting through the darkness and then all the wildebeest and zebra took off. Can you see anything, James? No. Well, I think we've lost her. We've spent quite a good time with her. It's been really, really nice. And what's interesting is that she's been contact calling and trying to locate another pride. And initially when we were with that pride earlier feeding, this lioness came in from the side 
which I thought was very strange. And I thought maybe it was a different pride altogether. And now she seems to be going over to the pride. So very, very difficult to understand. But anyway, that is what nature is. And we never, we can't understand it all. But in the meantime, Tristan Dix is with some very characteristic buffalo. Well, exactly. Sometimes under the cover of darkness, animals need their time to live their lives and do their thing on their own accord. As much as it's nice to see, it's also good to let them have their time. Now, the buff are still very relaxed. They're still taking it super easy. They're not really kind of worried about too much. And like I said, they don't have too much to worry about, unless, of course, the Nkuma Pride reunites and heads in this direction, because then they're going to have trouble. And it's going to be a tricky afternoon for these guys. And they look menacing with their glowing eyes in the darkness, don't they? It's kind of one of those things about buffalo when they stare at you in the infrared and it always looks so kind of menacing. They have these bright glowing eyes, which is a bit creepy and they look a lot more hectic than they do when normal, which is if that's even possible. Anyway, it is that time of the day where we head back home. It's the time of the day that the animals have the evening to themselves and hopefully tomorrow will bring about lots of interesting news and a reuniting of the Inkuma Pride. But it's been a special afternoon. We've had lots and lots of amazing sightings. It's been very, very cool. I've thoroughly enjoyed myself. Hopefully you guys have too. It sounds like there was lots happening all over. So from Taylor, Steve, myself, CamOps, Emma in Final Control, it's been an absolute pleasure. We'll see you all tomorrow morning on our Sunrise Safari.